بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم it is my pleasure and honor uh, to meet uh, the experts from uh, Jordan uh, allow me to speak in Arabic uh, طبعا أستاذنا الدكتور ياد سعيد هو متميز جدا جدا في تقديم الحالات ودائما واحد بيستمتع سواء كان في القاهرة من زمان أو في عمان أو مع الميتنج اللي فات تقديم الحالات very professional فيعني احنا بنتمنى له الصحة والسعادة ودايما يمتعنا بالحالات العظيمة جدا. أنا طبعا سبق وقدمت الدكتور رياض في في الميتنج اللي فات لكن سريعا الدكتور رياض بدأ الرحلة بتاعته كطبيب من سنة 68 من أكثر من 52 عام في عمري كله يعني ده خبرة كبيرة جدا وتخرج من جامعة القاهرة وده كانت حاجة جميلة جدا لحضرتك من خريج القاهرة ثم الاكسبيرينس من امريكا سواء في الانترنال ميديسن او في النفرولوجي ثم طبعا العوده الحميد الى عم الى الاردن الشقيق و لابتو بروفيسور تشاب وطبعا تم تكليل نجاح بجائزه الاي اس ان بايونير وفعلا حضرتك بايونير في الميدل ايست انا المره اللي فاتت الصوره دي يا دكتور سعيد كويس ان معانا الدكتور سعيد الغامدي دي الصوره دي قديمه من الارشيف بتاعنا مع الدكتور اسامه غيث طبعا احنا دايما بنسعد بوجود الدكتور ياد معانا والصوره دي فيها احباب كثيره جدا معاهم منهم هم معانا النهارده ومنهم اللي هيشوفوا الفيديو بعد كده الدكتور طارق طنطاوي معانا منور في الصوره الدكتور هشام السايل الدكتور علي طه هنا الدكتور مجد الشرقاوي والدكتور حسين الفشاوي طبعا مع حبيب الكل الدكتور رياض سعيد. ومع الدكتور طارق الباز طبعا وكان مع الدكتور هاني رئيس الجمعيه والدكتور كمال عكاشه في السيشن اللي فات في الجمعيه. ده الرصيد اللي موجود حاليا من محاضرات وفيديوهات على موقع الجمعيه عندنا وده كان من الزوم اللي فات استمتعنا جدا باربع حالات ولا اروع وتيتشنج بوينتس عظيمه الشان. النهارده بنتشرف بوجود الدكتور حسان زهير عناب طبعا الدكتور حسان زي ما الدكتور رياض بعت لي الميني سي في سينيور كونسلتنت للباثولوجي ان جنرال والنفرو باثولوجي واعتقد حضراتكم شايفين 70 سنه خريج سنه 75 برضو التريننج والبدايات كانت في امريكا وبعدين البورد الباثولوجي وبعدين كونسلتنت باثولوجي دايركتور لجوردن هوستل الباثولوجي وانشا حاجات كثيره جدا في في الباثولوجي والسوسايتيز بتاعه الباثولوجي فطبعا هو من الناس العظماء جدا في هذا المجال ودي احد السلايدز بتاعه الدكتور حسان اللي شفتها معاه في عمان انا مش علق عليها علشان بس واضح فيها الاكسبيرينس وكل حاجه واضحه كويس جدا وده من السلايد من من الحالات اللي قدمها مع الدكتور رياض سعيد في مؤتمر عمان. معانا النهارده كمودريتور استاذنا الغالي والحبيب الدكتور غنيمات. دكتور غنيمات يتميز ب يعني كميه تحضر غريبه جدا بنحسده عليها وبنتعلم منه حاجات كثيره قوي قوي وكرم الضيافه. ده كان في مؤتمر في عمان على الارض بنلاقي حفاوه وكرم والصوره دي طبعا بتضم الدكتور غنيمات مع الدكتور رياض مع وفد كبير جدا سواء من مصر او من الدول العربيه دكتور مي دكتور ايمن رفاعي دكتور روبرت نجم دكتور طارق الباز وبقيه الزملاء دكتور ونيمات يعني كرم وحفاوه الضيافه ما لهاش مثيل وده يعني بن دايما بنتشرف بيه وهنا لما كان معانا في الشابتر بتاع ترانسبلانتيشن مع الدكتور صبح مع الدكتور صبري جوهر مع الدكتور جمال السعدي طبعا ومع رئيس الجمعيه الدكتور هاني حافظ وفي دي صوره جمعت كل الاحباب في الشابتر بتاع ترانسبلانتيشن دكتور ونيمات في القلب هنا هو دكتور طارق طنطاوي دكتور عادل بكر دكتور دينا وناس كثيره جدا مش هنعد الاسماء برضو هنا من الصور اللي فيها ابتسامه لان احنا فعلا بن بنعتز بدكتور غنيمات مع الدكتور رشاد مع الدكتور طارق الباز هنا الرصيد موجود على المقر على الفيرشوال اكاديمي تسع محاضرات وفيديوهين ده احد الفيديوهات وده الفيديو الثاني بتاع المؤتمر السنوي اللي فات في فبراير المانجمنت اوف انيميا ان سي بي دي بيشنس ودي احد الصور طبعا بنعتز بحضرتك دكتور غنيمات مع كل هذه الصحبه طبعا دكتور 
اشرف هودا ودكتور مجد الشرقاوي ودكتور رئيس الجمعيه برجع تاني للدكتور رياض من الحاجات الجميله اللي بيعملها الدكتور غنيمات هو الحفاوه يعني ده في تكريم الدكتور رياض سعيد في 2017 في الامارات في مؤتمر ايمان يعني هنا الراجل دكتور غنيمات بيقدم الدكتور رياض وبحتفل بيه بجائزه البايونير اوورد من الجمل الجميله جدا وطبعا الدكتوره عزمتنا طبعا عزومه فاخره ما لا تنسى فاحد الجمل اللي كتبها الدكتور غنيمات وجمله جميله جدا وراء كل رجل عظيم امراه عظيمه ففعلا الدكتوره عظيمه جدا والايد في الايد بكونكر ذا وورلد از ا تيم يعني العالم كله بيخضع لهذا الكرم والصوره دي بتوضح مدى المحبه والمعزه اللي موجود الوطن العربي كله في الصوره ديت من من الامارات للاردن لمصر فكلها صحبه جميله جدا عشان كده بيحضرني بيت شعر هيبقى في سؤال هنا كويس في البيت اللي جاي ده يعني ما بنزور عمان او الاردن والنهارده هم معانا بيدونا من العلم بتاعهم زور داره ودن المهم البتاع بتيجي على على الكتابه زور داره ودن ان اردت وروده زادوك ودا ان راوك ودوده كلام جميل جدا 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 لكن في السؤال ايه ايه الاعجاز في البيت ده؟ الدكتور رياض معانا، ايه الاعجاز في البيت ده يا باشا؟ <تصفيق> عشان انت هتسالنا بعد شويه. لا 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 انا هاي ريفير ديس للدكتور محمد غنيمات. الدكتور غنيمات. ايه الاعجاز في البيت ده؟ يعني والله سؤالك مش سهل يا حسين <تصفيق> ابدا اني أبد. اعشق الشعر بس يعني ابدا مش سهل. شوف الكل... ابو الكلام ابو جميل. عبد العزيز بيساعدني يعني الكلام جميل ولا الدكتور الغامدي افتح الدكتور الغامدي جميل جدا الدكتور الغامدي حياك الله ايه 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 مناطق الجمال في في البيت ده والله الاعتماد على كلمات متكرره في هذا لا ومعاني متجانسه جناس في الموضوع فيها طبعا ده كلام آه واضح لو كده ما كنتش سالت ايوه محمد لكن <تصفيق> هو دار ود ان اردت وروده زاد ود ان راوك ودود قائم البيت كله قائم على ست احرف تقريبا من اللغه العربيه يعني ما انا لو كده برضه ما كنتش ما كنتش سالت يعني بس انت يعني ايه انت انت وطور سعيد بتقولوا نفس الكلام لكن بس انت عديتهم يعني فتحها كويس الجمال في القصه البيتين البيتين الشعر دول فيهم موده ومحبه غريبه غريبه الشان صح ولا غلط؟ اكيد بالتاكيد طبعا الاعجاز ان رغم ان هي كده ما فيش حرف يلزق في الثاني يعني كل الحروف غير متواصله يعني ما يكون الايه وراها الطهم فرغم ان الحروف متباعده عن بعضها ولا يمكن تتصل ببعضها الا انها بتعبر عن المحبه وهو ده البني ادمين كلنا كل واحد فيه المزايا بتاعته لو كله اجتمعت المزايا مش مهم نلزق في بعض يعني ف فجميل كورونا تايم <تصفيق> طبعا انا كان معانا الدكتور قوسي ما اعرفش هيلحق بنا ولا لا لكن الدكتور قوسي ليه معزه كبيره جدا في القلب وفي المنصوره والمحاضرات على الفيديو يعني هو من الناس القلائل اللي تمتعوا بالعلم والخبره والاخلاق الرفيعه ودي احد المحاضرات. النهارده بقى وصلنا لاخر سلايد. النهارده دكتور استاذنا الدكتور رياض سعيد اكيد محضر وجبه دسمه هو قال لي اربع حالات فور كيسز ويل بي ديسكازد ان شاء الله ومعانا الاخوه الاساتذه من الوطن العربي ومصر ومع هترك المجال لاستاذنا الفاضل الدكتور رياض المايك لسعادتك وانا هستوب الشير وحضرتك تقدر تشير معذرة انا بيه انا موجود معلش باشا ازاي حضرتك طب حضرتك شفت يعني اه طبعا يا بيه رد قلبي الحمد لله الحمد لله اكتملت دكتور محسن اكتملت الله يسلم الله يسلم سعادتك يا رب منورين والله الله يخليك الله يخليك منورين صحيح اكتملت البهجه لسبب ان الدكتور محسن احنا ما على انه استاذ مصري 
وعلى خلق والكلام ده آه. كله بيبصوا له وبيمثل مدرسه عريقه في الطب المدرسه الانجليزيه اللي هو لان هو كونسلتنت وبترشري كيرس كونسلتنت فبالتالي احنا اكيد هنستفيد من الخبره بتاعته في الحالات اللي يقدمها الدكتور اياد سعيد. انا هستوب هنا وهدي لحضرتك ال ال شير سلايد يا باشا. اتفضل. سلايد شيرد ولا لست بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم آه نبدا طبعا اليوم آه مستشفى الاردن آه زميلي الدكتور حسان عناب استشاري امراض والباثولوجي اللي موجود معانا من سنوات واصبح الان الحمد لله ريفرنس في عندنا في عمان والمنطقه آه كارينا الباثولوجيست آه ومعانا طبعا مشرفنا من عمان كمان صديقه واخي الدكتور محمد اللي هو الكل بيعرف المعزه بتاعته. Uh, our first case our first case is a 50 is a 30 year old female patient previously healthy admitted to our hospital with two weeks history of progressive lower limb edema, morning eye puffness and increase in body weight. Recent decrease in urine output, urine being frothy but no hematuria. No history of sore throat, chest pain, cough, fever, rash, jaundice or blood transfusions. No history of diabetes or hypertension. She's not on any regular medication and no history of non-steroidal use. She's gravid at two para two with no history of preeclampsia. She looked the young female patient, anxious, not in acute distress, eyes puffy, and she has no facial rash. Normal tensive, her weight is 65 kilos and febrile. Both cardiac and chest examination were normal. Abdominal examination revealed ascites without organomegaly. She has three plus, four plus lower limb edema. The skin looks fine, no rash, and no apparent joint swelling. Uh, her hemoglobin was 12.3 grams with normal white cap and platelets, ESR 25. She has normal PT, PTT, and INR. Her serum creatine was 2.8 milligram per deciliter with albumin 2.4. Normal liver enzymes. Her urine was striking, four plus protein, but no RBCs, few white cells, no casts. Spot urine protein creatine ratio 11.5 gram protein. She has an ultrasound, normal sized kidneys, increased echogenicity, no hydronephrosis, and patent renal veins. Chest normal by chest X ray, EKG, and echo reported normal. So, in summary, we have a 30-year-old female patient, healthy, with a recent onset of lower limb edema, morning buffness, which is nephrotic presentation, no evidence of systemic diseases. She is normotensive. She has proteinuria and impaired kidney function with bland urine analysis. Our working diagnosis was nephrotic syndrome, mostly idiopathic, with acute kidney injury. Now I leave the podium for Dr. Mohsen and Dr. Mohammed Rmima. <laughs> uh, I would like just to have uh, Dr. Mohammed Basha. Would you like to, to start? If you would like to start Dr. Mohammed Ghunaymat. It's up to what you, you would like. You can go ahead, Dr. Mohsen. Okay. Uh, just a question. If there is any family history of a similar case in the family? Not really. So there is no history of nephrotic syndrome in the family? Yes. Right, okay. And she has not been treated by anything before she is coming to... Uh, not at all. Not at all. No diuretics, and, uh, no uh, ACE or any, whatever it would be. No, she basically no medication at all. And clearly she is not pregnant. No. She is not pregnant. Uh, probably the, uh, the last question I would like to say that you are saying that there is no systemic feature whatsoever um, uh, for a systemic disease. That's true. Right, okay. She's not asthmatic? No, no history of asthma or anything like this? Uh, honestly, I, I can't you don't know. That. Okay, so uh, probably we need to do the, I mean, the immunology now, but we are just going to look into the FSGS maybe as a possibility, or oh, because she has got no evidence of microscopic hematuria. Uh, the minimal change could be, but, but the acute kidney injury without any treatment, I doubt it, to be honest. Um, membrane proliferative could be a possibility, but again, uh, just, I mean, frank nephrotic syndrome, 
still I would go for the FSGS as a first possibility. Even uh, with normal blood pressure? With normal blood pressure, you can encounter, I mean, particularly for the genetic forms. Okay. Because I would like to ask at the end, if it is FSGS, to go for the genetic forms to see the genetic analysis of this uh, girl. Or of this I, think, I think membranes should be added to could the be, differential could diagnosis. Be, definitely. Yeah. It could be, but as I'm saying, there is no evidence of microscopic hematuria. Usually, I would like to see, uh, we will do the immunology anyway. And the immunology right. will give us some insight what's going on. Okay, I think immunology is important and the yeah. biopsy, is, biopsy is extremely indicated, but mm -hmm. uh, to complete the, the clinical data, we but should have all the immunological profile. Immunology. Me membranous, is, membranous is here a is, possibility. So it is your immunology. It is your immunology. Right. Antiphospholipase A2 is indicated as well. Because Definitely. this is, this is a standard of care for. nowadays for the management of membranous nephropathy to have uh, the antiphospholipase A2 as well for this case. So we have ANAs, anti-DNAs, negative, hepatitis B, hepatitis C negative, anti-GBM negative, ANCA negative, C3, C4 negative. And I heard someone talking about antiphospholipase A2 and here, and it's really negative. Right. So all your serology now that you requested is available to you. Still, is it minimal change? Is it focal? It membranous, where we stand now. The three possibilities are there. <laughs> yes. I mean, yes. the, the FSGS, the membranous, the minimal change, even with the acute kidney injury, to be honest, and with the absence of microscopic hematuria. The biopsy will tell us what's going on. Even okay. if, if, if antiphospholipase A2 receptor antibody is negative, it doesn't exclude that primary true. membranes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, it reduces the likelihood. Yes. It reduces the likelihood. There of, yes, there is a percentage, but FGS will yeah. be on the top of the list of the uh, of the pathology. This is from my expectation. Okay, so let's move on. Okay. So we have basically idiopathic nephrotic syndrome. In fact, I did not entertain personally focal segmental because of the lack of the hypertension. And yes, with the sudden onset, it could be. And membranous nephropathy. Now that's there. What about the acute kidney injury? Now we have a patient. We agree about the nephrotic syndrome. We entertain the possibilities. Now what about the acute kidney injury in association with the idiopathic nephrotic syndrome? Any thoughts? To be honest, I mean, the acute kidney injury, we don't know the historical records of this lady prior to, I mean, to present to ourselves. So we don't know the baseline serum creatinine, whether it was entirely normal or there was some sort of impairment prior to presentation. If there is no impairment before and it was entirely normal kidney function, or we assuming that, so this is definitely will be acute kidney injury. Or it might be some sort of ongoing chronic process. And uh, I mean, this is on the top of what she has presented now. So Dr. Saeed Al-Ghamdi, Dr. Saeed Al-Ghamdi wants to add a comment. Yeah. Dr. Saeed. Well, uh, yes, uh, acute kidney injury in the face of massive nephrotic syndrome uh, has been described even with the more benign conditions yes, like- uh, Minimal changes. Minimal, minimal change in property. And actually we have seen that when it responds very well to, to, to treatment. Uh, uh, this one of the possibilities. This patient is the young age group. Otherwise, I'll think about paraproteinemia as another uh, possibility, like uh, light chain nephropathy and other things, uh, as uh, one of the things which is in the background. That can honestly, I think, probably of more uh, the possibility of focal segmental. Certainly, it's there. I mean, focal segmental. Uh, but usually, if you be the acute onset of a kidney, acute kidney injury, probably I'll think I'll, I'll be more inclined to think about. Uh, uh, similar uh, possibility of uh, minimal change and others, and then I'll put after that the focal segmental and other like the baraproteinemia or plasma cell disease, despite there is nothing really quite anything suggestive of that in the, in the history or in the uh, current uh, what you call uh, investigation which has been done. Thank you. And, okay. and uh, a good kidney injury in a case of nephrotic syndrome, it is not a strange phenomena because minimal change may be complicated because of oncotic pressure. A domain because it is uh, reduced either by the hypoalbuminemia or by abusing the use of diuretics. Interstitial nephritis also is the cause of acute kidney injury in with minimal uh, change disease or with FGS. 
superimposed crescentic form of uh, glomerulonephritis on top of uh, any of the morphological patterns of injury may be a cause. Uh, um, and I think a biopsy will, will add a lot to our information. I will diagnose the case. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Now, I came across a very nice article here describing pathogenesis of acute kidney injury in patients with nephrotic syndrome. It's really a recent one, July uh, 19 to 19, and they entertained acute tubular necrosis, yes. acute interstitial nephritis, don't forget renal vein thrombosis, warfarin toxicity, drug toxicity, and aggressive nature of the disease. And as Dr. Hussein Shaish mentioned, crescentic GN superimposed on top of membranous or other diseases. Now, from what I hear, really, we know that uh, hypovolemia, aggressive diuresis, and other can cause this, but the urine sediment really looks perfect. So it's very, you know, it could be still ATN. Uh, we have no skin rash, no fever, nothing, no history of non-steroidal. We have normal ultrasound, and we have Doppler ultrasound, which is perfect, showed no evidence of renal vein thrombosis, at least by Doppler patent renal veins. Higher INR is perfect, which is really warfarin toxicity. And we have no hematuria to call this is the case. A drug, she's not on calcium urine inhibitors. Aggressive disease, she's not HIV. We do not really test for HIV because collapsing glomerulopathy, it can cause this. So really, that's here what we looked in or that what we discussed. Mostly we exclude crescentic because normal urine analysis. We excluded another GN here. And we looked about uh, drug toxicity, warfarin, and renal vein thrombosis. So really what's left for us, it's a possibility of acute tubular necrosis or acute, yes, tubular necrosis, possibility interstitial nephritis. We don't know the drugs, but definitely this lady admitted no medication. So really, if you see biopsy, biopsy, biopsy is indicated. So really, that's the spectrum of what we see with acute kidney injury in a patient with nephrotic syndrome presentation in primary GNs. Now, our next step is biopsy. Now, I think what we have on the kidney biopsy, 25 glomeruli on the light microscopy, uh, we have immune fluorescence studies for glomeruli, and we kept a small sample for possible, if needed, electron microscopy. Now, Dr. Hassan, please, the floor is yours. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Now, as you can see, the, the, can you hear me? Yes, we hear yes. you well, okay. very well. Okay. Uh, as you can see, there is a good number of glomeruli in this uh, specimen. And at this magnification, probably we cannot say much about the kidney. Can we? Yes. Okay. So this is higher, higher magnification. Uh, the glomeruli, they look normal at this magnification, but uh, as you can see, there are some areas where there is uh, probably some interstitial edema. And some of these tubules, they look abnormal, very thin epithelium. Uh, can we go to the higher magnification? The other one, yeah. This is the glomerulus. Maybe the, uh, the capillary loops are slightly prominent, but they are not that much uh, in, uh, thickened. Uh, there is a interstitial edema, as you can see, the tubes are separated from each other here, and maybe there are very few small uh, lymphocytes in the background. Can I have the other one, please? The other slide. Okay, there is one sclerosis glomerulus here. Uh, so the, some of these tubules, they can see that they are shrunken with the pycnotic uh, nuclei, which means that there is probably some tubular injury in this case. And uh, if you can see it sometimes, some areas there is loss of the tubular epithelial cells here, the nuclei. Only the cytoplasm is left. Uh, can you go to the, another one? The next one, please. Here. Yeah. Again, the glomeruli, they look healthy, but some of the, there is my, a little bit of interstitial edema and some of the tubules are not quite healthy like these tubules. They have very thin epithelium and large pycnotic nuclei, which indicates uh, uh, tubular injury and some recovery of the tubular epithelial cells. Next slide, please. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. I think this the this is the tubule that shows very thin epithelium and some uh, loss of the nuclei, like here, and there is some interstitial infiltrate. These tubules are also they show the crowding of the nuclei, which is a regenerative process. And same thing here. So I think that is what you call hub, hub nails. Yeah, some of these, but not the typical uh, hapnel, because the uh, hapnel, the nuclei are usually larger, but uh, you see, this is a hapnel, these, these, because they are sticking inside the lumen of the tubule. But as you can see, the glomeruli are more or less normal. Uh, can I go to the next one? What about this tubule here, Hassan? This tubule is atrophic. There are a few atrophic tubules with thyroidization like this one. Uh, this tubule and these, all of them are abnormal. Like I said, they have the, uh, this is a PS stain. Uh, you can see that the, the, the basement membranes of the capillary loops are a little bit prominent, but not really thick as we'd like to see in membranes, the property. Uh, the, tub the tubules, they show nice tubular basement membrane here, and there is, little bit of interstitial edema, as you can see, separating the tubules. Can I go to the next one? Next slide, please. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is another PS stain also, showing that uh, uh, there is the, the, there's no significant fibrosis. Okay. This is the hope nail that I'm talking about. This tubules, you can see that the nuclei are sticking inside the lumen. So this is a hopnail appearance of the tubular epithelial cells, which is characteristic of acute tubular injury. Here, here, all of these tubules. Because that's, but these recovering. tubules are normal. This is recovering. Yeah. It, it indicates that there is a recovery and... Uh, so it's a signal, signal, the, signal of excessive mitosis. Uh, yeah, sometimes. I, I don't think I, I, I took a picture of uh, mitosis, but mm. I'm sure there are some mitosis in here somewhere. Yeah. Okay. okay. Same thing. So, can I, yeah. These are the same, the same type of changes in the tubules. They are indicative of uh, tubular injury with interstitial edema, but not much in the way of fibrosis or... Okay. I think, yeah. So that's no, the... Yeah. No significant fibrosis, and even the there is no significant tubular atrophy actually. So, so the glomeruli were not bad, uh, Doctor Hassan. They were not bad. No, no, the, the glomeruli mo most of them were normal. And Maybe a little bit no of the tubular basement membranes, but not much significant. No self stain for the uh, membranes to see or the... sorry, I can't hear you. No, we don't do self stain, by the way. I see. No, we don't. No. We okay. do, uh, the PS is very good actually, we do uh, and uh, it helps a lot. So the light microscopy, we have 25 glomeruli, it looks like minimal change disease, acute tubular injury, which is really recovering. Then we have the immune fluorescence, which is absolutely totally negative for anything. It's IgA, IgG, IgM, C3, C4, and all that is negative. So really summing all this, our pathological diagnosis, as Dr. Hassan really put it to us, minimal change disease, recovering acute tubular necrosis. And ma minna, ma minna electron microscope, Riyadh? I have it. You know, we did not send it because really we did not feel really it should be with this kind of findings. So I agree, I, I agree with you, Professor Riyadh, for this point that the pathology is clear. It is a minimal change with acute tubular injury that is expected. And um, let us go uh, to, to, uh, for the, 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 the management part of the case. Okay, so how we'd like to manage, how we manage the space. Patient received steroid therapy and then daily for three days and then prednisone after that orally, furosemide IV with later oral on, BBIs, oral calcium supplement and ARBs. The question yeah. here, Dr. Riyad, yes. why yes. you give pulse steroid? I know from the pediatric side, in pediatric, they love uh, steroid pulses because of the poor absorption of oral steroid. But in adult, 
We are accustomed to use oral steroid, one milligram per kg per day, and to uh, preserve the pulse steroid for crescentic or other, other lesion, but, but minimal change. And I would like to hear from Dr. Kousi, the okay. strategy of management. Yes. Okay. Dr. Kousi. Yeah, we usually don't use the pulse steroid in minimally change disease. Mm. We go straight away for the oral uh, prednisolone, uh, 60 milligram, as you've just done, uh, uh, for four weeks and see how it goes, obviously depending on the uh, body weight of the patient. And usually, I mean, 95% of the young uh, patients, they respond very well to the oral steroids without the need of the pulse. So I don't know the experience. In, in, pediatric, in pediatric series, if the, if the diagnosis is FSHS, there is preference for the use of pulse steroid because the intestine in the children is um, in child is uh, limited by the size of the intestine and by edema of the gut accompanying nephrotic syndrome. So I think some of them prefer pulse steroid, but in adults, uh, we don't I think the same, same. I think the same thing is true okay. for adults with this fluid in our tummy. It is not wrong. Uh, it is not a wrong. Uh, um, but the, the, uh -huh. just this is. Um, this is the and that usually it will fasten. I think it will be will put the inflammation and the uh, response will be much better later on. And you you can really shorten the uh, recovery period uh, in the hospital, stay in the hospital, and all that. Uh, it looks really always it works really good. So that I raised at this point, to Dr. Yad, because the standard of care of minimal change is not pulse stroke. But uh, I know it will work and it will help the patient with excessive edema of the, in, of the kidney. But even the uh, GN um, KD guidelines and others, uh, I think pulse steroid is not uh, within the, the primary line of treatment of minimal change disease. Even with the acute kidney injury that you have initially? But acute kidney injury here is due to acute pillar injury, wow. not uh, that. Uh, you know, be honest, give this treatment that, uh, before be giving before we having the kidney biopsy. Okay, even with the, with the acute kidney injury, to be honest, because the steroids in theory shouldn't help with the acute kidney injury anyway. Uh, it is, I mean, uh, usually I, I don't know. I mean, about this pulse steroid and minimally change it, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But we don't try it even with the acute kidney injury because the acute kidney injury we know that it will not be helped by the pulse steroid. Don't forget that. This is one gram for yes. three days for a lady who is 30 years old is too much for her, I believe. If she's going to respond to oral, I'm not sure the risk of the, I mean, of the colleagues, or how do they feel about what they do? Uh, and, and excuse me, Dr. Ramassin, there is a nice comment from Dr. Tarat on Tawan the Shad. Uh, the blood pressure is low and the patient has acute kidney injury. Why ARBs? are included in the management of this no, We didn't reach the uh, ARBs and uh, the diuretics. We are just, I mean, talking still about the steroid and I would yes. like to see if there's anyone else agree with the pulse or not for these cases. I'm not sure, to be honest. Although I it mean, is not the, written, the, but... The, uh, evidence, uh, yeah, okay. the evidence is more clear in children than in adults, but still some schools yes. use um, pulse steroids. Probably the, the, the dose is better higher than what it should be, but pulse steroids are still used in, in, in some schools. I, I didn't object, and um, it is rational to use a steroid anyway. And it is three days pulse steroid followed by oral steroid. So, but this is, this is not the usual practice that we follow in adult medicine, but it is not wrong. It is okay. well, it, I agree it's not wrong and you know it's all in the older literature yes. definitely there is some studies controlling IV with control in fact in British Medical Journal I was looking on something right now really it's an old study which yes. is an 85 which, you know we're not going to go back to that but I don't think see really there is a wrongdoing by no, doing that no, no, to me, no, no, no. Okay, to me yes. it was really has the recovery and before we have the kidney biopsy or you know if the diagnosis was widely open, is okay. it drug-induced in persistent nephrititis and others, and that's why also we went really through the treatment with this route. What now, about the ARBs? What about the ARBs? Someone wins it about the ARBs. The yes. ARBs, I think it's a good choice, always with an older steroid later on saving, and yes, her blood pressure is not that bad, around 110, 120, and usually it works also as antiprotonic agent. It will help with the steroid later on. Dr. Kosi. 
to be honest, if we have got a patient who has got acute kidney injury, and we know that this is acute kidney injury, and we have got this minimally changing disease, we try to avoid as much as we can any hemodynamic compromise to the uh, renal perfusion, such as the ACE or ARBs at the initial stage until they start to respond, blood pressure is getting a bit better, kidney function is improving, and there is some sort of recovery, then we can add the ACE or ARB later on as an antiprotonic agent. I agree with you. This is really, you know, just the sum of the management. And as you notice, as this was started later on. If you look about her, the excellent diuresis we have, the drop in her serum creatinine. In fact, by the end of the week, her serum creatinine is down to 1.3. Her proteinuria decreased from 11.5 to 6.5. Seen three weeks later, normal tensive, no edema, creatinine 0.8. Serum albumin picked up proteinuria 1.5 gram. Last follow-up a month later, she was in complete remission, tapering her steroid therapy, and then to be stopped after, you know, four weeks after that. Because really she went into complete remission with complete recovery of her kidney function. So this is a lucky end, but the problem again, I don't agree about ARPs and diuretics in a case of acute tubular injury in a nephrotic syndrome. So, um, and the pathologist- You don't agree about diuretics. How are you yep. going to diurese this patient with this profound edema and acetic load in her tummy and plus, all that? I, I mean diuretic plus ERBs. So RBs is, oh, okay. for, for okay. my mind, so it is obsolete. Yes, we have okay. oncotic pressure in the very low oncotic pressure and the high potent, on high potential side. So it's enough to give diuretics, but diuretic and the RBs, I think RBs is not, is not, I don't agree about the RBs and the, the floor is for discussion for this point. Dr. Sure. Kosi, do you agree about this point? Uh, this is what I have mentioned. Yes. Usually, if we know that the patient has got minimally changing disease and acute kidney injury, we don't use, and there, there is some sort of, I mean, impairment, as you can see by the acute kidney injury, we don't use the ACE or R to compromise the uh, hemodynamics yes. of the kidney. So we avoid them completely until there is some sort of stabilization of the kidney function and improvement. Uh, once this is, has happened, then we can start the ACE and ARP uh, to just as an antiprotonic agent, okay. particularly help the show's fine. Okay. So okay. we don't use it. Dr. Gunaymet? Um, I probably would agree because uh, Riyadh, he has the courage to start ARBs very early, but um, um, I, I would add probably ARBs later on, okay. not early on in the... Um, uh... Okay. Uh, so you agree with us? That, uh, Agree that yes, I, yes. I will I, I will add it later. I would probably won't start uh, ARBs from from the beginning. Uh, so this is uh, uh, other point raised here about the uh, use of statin. Uh, the our uh, our our policy for statin in nephrotic syndrome, if uh, if it is minimally changed and we are expecting. Uh, the re remission of nephrotic state, uh, we may postpone statin for a period, for a while. But I did not use a statin. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Uh, doctor, uh, so um, is, uh, you don't like statin? If, if no, no, no. I did not really use it in this patient okay. because it looks really, you know, things, hopefully it was in the proper direction going okay. on. The, the, I mean, the, 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 uh, saying the consensus is that if you're going to use steroids for more than three months and statins probably would um, yes, yes. would be a good idea. And if the, if the lesion like here minimally change, it's better to, uh, to wait. wait for a period, right. for a short right. period of time. But if it is chronic GN with uh, dyslipidemia, a statin can be introduced, yes. So I think it is very nice case and um, we can move on, ex except if there is any compelling comment. You know, one thing I'd like to say really, nephrosarca, you know, we hear a lot about nephrosarca and why the acute kidney injury will occur in such patient with the heavy proteinuria like this patient. The visceral layer of the uh, botocytes basically will be swollen, will close the slit, uh, the pores, you know, slit pores, and that will contribute to more to the acute kidney injury as really illustrated here 
that's not the patient, that's from the teaching file where you can see really complete fusion of the foot processes. And that can contribute also to some element for the acute kidney injury. So that's the first case we have. Any comment? Further comment? We can, we can give five minutes for the audience. Uh, if they yeah. like to comment, just raise hand and then we have comment uh, discussion for five minutes. Dr. Mohammed Saeed, do you like to speak? Uh, uh, I agree with the Dr. is a case of minimal exchange. But what, li why, what I would like to mention here, uh, any patient adult with minimal exchange disease, we have to be very cautious about secondary causes. So we have to go uh, follow this patient carefully in the future because we saw many patients, they present early with minimal exchange and later they might develop progenic lymphoma or lymphomoroliferative disease. So uh, adult minimal exchange uh, uh, needs a cautious for up uh, not to miss other secondary causes for minimal exchange disease. Agree. Uh, it's okay, it's fine, uh, and very nice point. I think one of the very interesting points raised by uh, Dr. Riyad, uh, renal vent thrombosis possibility in the fertic syndrome, the issue that shouldn't be neglected anymore. Because in the past, we were afraid of giving anticoagulation or antiblitic for the patients. I, I want just to share with you one of the very smart protocols, I think, from UK, from um, one of the uh, very prestigious centers there. Uh, it is very dynamic, dynamic and a simple approach. If the patient is nephrotic, with serum albumin less than two, then anticoagulation is indicated to avoid as prophylaxis. And if albumin improves after treating the nephrotic syndrome by specific treatment and reaches three, then they stop anticoagulation and give antiplatelet. Uh, sorry, above two to three, they stop anticoagulation and give antiplatelet. Above three, they stop antiplatelet altogether. And if the patient relapses below three to two, uh, antiplatelet below two, it is anticoagulation. I would like to hear from Dr. Kosi uh, his opinion about this, this very smart this protocol. Exactly, this is exactly what we do. If the uh, serum albumin less than 20 gram, we yes. go for anticoagulation, anticoagulation with the low molecular weight heparin uh, or even warfarin. If the patient has recovered or the serum albumin has improved, better than the 20 gram, we go for the antiplatelet. If it is normalized or near to the 30, we stop everything in terms of the antiplatelet and the anticoagulant. Uh, okay, uh, I, I, uh, I, I, think it, I think it's uh, Dr. Faisal. Dr. Faisal is, uh, is okay. Uh, I think. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, Dr. The, the issue of I think for the, uh, the issue of anticoagulation, I think, is different from different types of primary nephrotic. Yani membranous, it is known that it is hypercoagulable state, and the anticoagulation uh, according to the album level is uh, prescribed and already uh, recorded in literature. But minimal change, uh, uh, the, the issue of thrombophilia and thrombosis, I think, is a little bit less than in membranous. I can agree I, with you. Can, it I, is, can, I, can I can I have a, a, a comment here? Okay, please. I was I was about to mention all these sort of dilemma, but I didn't like to confuse anybody. Okay. To be honest, we have seen patients with many many change disease with the yeah. I mean albumin uh, level less than twenty gram, and they have developed PEs. Whether this PE is because of the nephrotic state, which is most probably because we didn't find or encounter anything else, and that's why we are using it as a, an umbrella. Anyone who has got proteinuria persists less than 20 gram, obviously, persists more than four weeks, we will go ahead with the anticoagulation regardless of the etiology, whether it is FSGS, membranous, or even minimal change. I remember a case uh, uh, I followed. She was a nurse uh, with FSGS and the uh, renal vein thrombosis, IVC thrombosis. So, um, yes, membranous is associated with many thrombophilia but it, is, uh, you, it, it can occur with all nephropathies. This is why this center policy is smart and they included all nephrotic states and the majority were uh, membranous, but uh, all lesions were represented in this center experience. I like it because it's luckily, very- Luckily enough, 
Yes. Luckily, this patient really, she did not stay longer yes. hypoalbuminemic. She really did well, and she did not require really anticoagulation. And what, oh, this is what, why the cause of the minimally change, they don't require that much for the anticoagulation. Okay. So they usually respond very well to this. That's true. Uh, he, 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 excuse me, Dr. Mohammed. In the chat here, there's the acrylomus monotherapy after IV missile bread in adult with the... Uh, uh, minimal chain nephrotic syndrome? Yes, you can have it. Oh, it's there. Yes. It's been reported. Uh, again, you pulse steroid therapy followed by tacrolimus. Yes. But please, please make it. Oh. I mean, common is the common. I yes. mean, see in the eye for a patient with this inverted kidney function. And usually we know that the minimal chain disease, even in the adults, they are sensitive to the steroids. I would withhold all these measures unless it is failed, frequent relapsers, or something like this. 100% right. So, some, uh, yeah, from, uh, from my mind, if the patient is obese with multiple comorbidities and the patient refuses uh, to uh, be treated with a steroid, uh, we have alternative like calcium inhibitor in this, in, 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 in and the and studies is, on yes. the studies on tacrolimus are uh, pulse steroids for three days as well, and then mm. continue on tacrolimus. Yes. First, I'll go to Hassan. Maybe I'll go to Hassan. Can I ask a question? Go to Hassan. Go to Hassan. Do you sign the report as minimal change without EM? Well, if the uh, immunofluorescence is completely negative, I don't see any. Uh, I know that there are some cases where you would. Uh, the EM will come back as uh, FSGS, but this is the uh, one of the shortcomings that uh, you have to accept when you. Uh, and do you think it? Uh, uh, I think the problem, yeah. Dr. Mohammed, mm -hmm. even if if there is because you can do electromicroscope and no sclerotic glomeruli. If there is no sclerotic glomeruli, at the end of the day, minimum, the the diagnosis of EM will be minimal change too. So this is the problem. By of the way, we have sample, always, yes. By the way, we have always keep a sample for electron yes. microscopy. Uh, excellent. We feel it is needed. Okay. Uh, excellent. And we it's, move to the second case. Shukran, yes, please. Shukran, shukran. yes, please, please. Okay, that will be more interesting than the first one. I hope. Okay. Now this is a young man who came to us from Iraq. He came in for evaluation of abnormal kidney function. He was told to have abnormal kidney function for the first time at age 22, that means four years earlier, and his serum creatine was 2.5 milligram per deciliter with estimated GFR of 37 ml per minute. No history of hematuria, edema, arthritis, history of recurrent urinary tract infection, stone disease, or any history of systemic illness. No hearing abnormalities. Now, there is a strong family history of renal disease. His father died with end-stage kidney disease on dialysis. Older brother received a kidney transplant at the age of 25. Younger sister cannot repeat it for CKD stage 3A. No family history of deafness or eye abnormality. He's a young man, not in acute distress. He's underweight, 56 kilos, normotensive. Normal cardiac exam, abdominal exam, high puffiness not present, no lower limb edema, peripheral pulsation intact, CNS grossly intact. His hemoglobin, he's anemic. Serum creatine, 4.5 milligram per deciliter. His calcium, 8.4. Albumin, 3.5. And his PTH level was 375. Goes really with the chronic illness that we witnessed. Now, his urine analysis, very few RBCs, white cells, two plus protein, no casts. And he has 1.4 gram proteinuria. Ultrasound, normal size kidneys, increased echogenicity, no scarring present, no stones, no hydronephrosis, chest normal, echocardiography, ejection fraction 56%. Now, what other test or test do you need? Dr. Mohsen? <laughs> I mean, this is, I mean, clearly from the, I mean, the genetic pattern that you mentioned, there is, yeah. I mean, a dominant inheritance of the problem. And I would like to go for genetic studies, obviously with the bi biopsy. I, I don't think that I will just go for any prior to having a kidney biopsy and genetic studying for this uh, family. Any other test you'd like to have, you know, what you're in mind concerning this as a potential diagnosis? 
So focal segmental glomerular sclerosis is one of the top possibilities. Yes, yes I agree with this point. And okay. I think, I think yeah. the history, and I think the history here is very important. This is why uh, we educate ourselves and uh, our colleagues. If we, are, if we deal with any nephrology, we should ask about the family history. Family history is very important. Again, uh, he's normotensive. Yes. Urine yes. analysis is okay. The only thing, proteinuria with impaired kidney function. Okay. It is, I mean, like that, the, the, the interstitial collagen problems, to be honest, there is um, many, I mean, uh, recent description of the uh, collagen disorders that can cause dominant inheritance of the chronic kidney disease. I'm not entirely sure about this level of proteinuria with the FSGS. This is a very typical dominant inheritance pattern. And the, I mean, the dominant inheritance pattern in FSGS cases is not that strong like, like what we see here in this case. So I, still, I, I would like to go for the, I, I don't know about the test. I would like to go for the biopsy, including the electron okay. microscopy, obviously, okay. and then the, the genetic study. Okay. Study, I think it is important here in this case. We have serology. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. We have the serology. All the serology is negative. And then we have an audiogram. Someone really did not talk about Alport. As heritage. Uh, because you mentioned, I mean, the, about the Alport, you said that, I mean, uh, the patient has got a uh, normal uh, ear function. No hearing problems, hearing. problems, yes. There is no hearing. Yeah, but again, it is not again, necessarily to be clinically. Subjective. And again, <laughs> and again, she, he has got a sister who is doing very well. Uh, sorry, he has got end-stage renal disease, which usually, usually runs a benign course in the females. So I well, I, I tend to disagree, really. In females, when we have Alport syndrome, mm -hmm. the classic teaching that they do worse than the male patients, and we have a good number of them, really, I have at least two to three patients at one time, they have really female patients already on dialysis with Alport syndrome. Right. So when Dr. they have Dr. it- Dr. Saeed uh, raised the, the hereditary interstitial nephritis, Dr. Saeed Khamis uh, on the chat. Uh, yes. Yes, so a lot of diagnoses were written on the chat. So yes. we can go ahead. Okay, so our clinical diagnosis, stage four, CKD, mostly familiar hereditary nephropathy. What the most likely diagnosis, it really, uh, we know inherited disease, it's a good number, 10% of our patients, they have it. And it's a very common, fifth common cause, really, end stage renal disease after diabetes, hypertension, GN, and potential pyelonephritis. I got this slide, really, it's a very nice slide, will show you inherited kidney disease, you know, with the kidney. It could be glomerular, could be interstitial, could be any part of the nephron, really. It's a very nice slide that really I found. And you can pick your choice of whatever really renal disease, in addition, of course, adult polycystic that we don't have here in the case. So is it glomerular or it's interstitial? Biopsy. So the biopsy. The microscopy of the biopsy. We have, <laughs> we have on the biopsy, generous biopsy, 48 glomeruli. On light microscopy, immune fluorescent studies, seven glomeruli were available. And now, Dr. Hassan, the floor is yours for the biopsy. Okay, so as you can see, uh, this core, uh, even at this power, we can see that there are patchy areas of uh, kidney or renal disease. Uh, some areas, the tubules are preserved, like here, and other areas here, there is loss of the tubules with. Uh, fibrosis. Uh, this is a higher power view just to uh, illustrate the same thing. Uh, some of these tubules are preserved, but here uh, the, this glomerulus looks healthy. Uh, even at this power, you start appreciating to see there are very abnormal large nuclei of tubular epithelial cells like these here and some of these here and here. And uh, even in these uh, traffic tubules, you can see large. And, uh, uh, out of the 48 glomeruli, uh, 22, I think they were completely sclerosed, obsolete glomeruli. The blood vessels were thickened, as you can see here and here uh, and here. Uh, there is significant structure. So I, ha loss. I have, uh, up to this point, I have some suggestion, Dr. Riyad. Yes. Uh, is it cardiomegalic interstitial nephritis? Well, we will see now. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, Dr. Hassan. So you can see here that these are uh, tubular, uh, the nuclei of these tubular epithelial cells are, are quite abnormal. They are large with prominent nuclei, and some of them are even suggested that there might be some viral inclusions in them, and there is interstitial lymphocytic infiltrate in the background, and there's atrophic tubules. This is a glomerulus, more or less, it looks normal. There might be some mild mesangial prominence, but nothing to comment on. Uh, again, you can see all the, look at this nucleus. It looks like there is viral inclusion in it. And nuclei are prominent in some of them. And these tubules are also abnormal. They have a, a thin epithelium, a loss of the nuclei in them. The next one, please. Look at this gigantic nucleus, very abnormal nuclei. Now, <clears throat> when I was doing my residency, when we see, they, they, Vitamin B12 was uh, thought to, to induce uh, nuclear megaly throughout the whole body, including the tubular epithelial cells and everywhere else. And I thought really when I first looked at this case that this was probably, I asked Dr. Riyad if he had this patient had vitamin B12 deficiency, which he did not have actually. Uh, so can we go to the next one? Yes. Next slide, please. Again, uh, can, uh, we, uh, can I, can uh, I, okay, the, look at this nucleus. And these, look at these. This looks like there is a viral inclusion in it. So we entertain the possibility that this could be a viral inclusion or could be uh, cardiomegalic uh, interstitial nephritis. And there, this is a sclerosis glomerulus, and this is almost normal glomerulus. Look at these, they are the same. Very abnormal looking, very large. These nuclei are about four or five times the size of normal uh, nuclei of tubular epithelial cells here and here. So these are extremely abnormal. And uh, this tubule has got some uh, white blood cell cast in it. Okay? Yes. Next one. Yeah, this one. Okay. Very thin tubular. Okay, again, same thing. All of these very large nuclei compare the size of this nucleus to these, which are almost the normal size. So it's what, four or five times the size of the nuclei. Next one. Same thing. Same thing, all of it, yes. And these are atrophic tubules with thyroidization. And there's foci, there are foci of lymphocytic infiltrate and few, uh, even a few uh, eosinophils. But again, same type of change in the nuclei, okay? Uh, this is a PA stain, and you can see that some of the tubular, uh, some of the uh, tubules have uh, thickened, uh, wrinkled the tubular basement membrane, and this is an uh, sclerosis glomerulus. The same thing here, you can see these uh, thickened base membranes with wrinkled appearance. Uh, and these are the large abnormal nuclei, okay? This is sclerosis glomerulus. Uh, that one probably is sclerosis also. Next one, please. Okay, what do you think about this? Pardon me? What do you this think one? about yeah, this? Yeah, yeah, of course. Large, large nucleus. Very huge, very, large. very huge. Huge, huge nucleus. Okay, so, yeah. so basically, very and that's the trichrome. Trichrome, yes, and shows their extensive fibrosis as well. It's so, involving about 40% of the. So it's cardiomegalic. So it's cardiomegalic interstitial nephritis because we, so have, a we case, have we have a case like this. So we have here, uh, if you allow me, the most significant cells, really significant tubular atrophy with excessive tubular injury, marked enlarged bizarre nuclei, some showing viral-like inclusions. The special stains, basically, it's not really, there is no amyloid. We have significant fibrosis, as Dr. Hassan mentioned, 22 of the glomerate are sclerosed. So what other studies do you want? Further studies on the biopsy. Dr. Mahfid. <laughs> no idea. It is no a rare idea. case. It uh, is a rare case, Dr. Yad. And, um, Okay, anyway, now, the problem what is, about the viral, what about the viral-like inclusion bodies? This is a classic differential diagnosis, BK versus cardiomegalic interstitial nephritis. Even we have the cytomegalovite, Dr. Hassan. 
Okay, we did, uh, and, uh, this is a CMV immunohistochemical chemical stain and it is negative. You can see yes. all of these. Uh, actually, uh, from the viral inclusions that we usually see, this does not really look like uh, in the BK virus yes, inclusions. Yes. Because these, are, these the BK viral inclusions are very, hum they have a homogeneous appearance with the condensation of the chromatin at the periphery, but these, they look different. Uh, I thought probably more in the direction of CMV, but it was completely negative. Uh, when it, if it is positive, you will find either nuclear or cytoplasmic uh, brownish staining, which is not present here. So this CMV was negative, and uh, why CMV? the other viral including Hassan, why, why CMV? Because CMV why is CMV? cytoplasmic, and the, 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 the major problem here in the nuclei. I'm sorry, I didn't understand the, the question. Why, why, uh, me, why cytomegalovirus? You think of cytomegalovirus, and the majority of cytomegalovirus is cytoplasmic inclusion rather than big nuclei. Well, I, I agree with you, but you can sometimes you can yes. find them in the nuclei. So we have to do it. I mean, this is uh, the other. This uh, is why. This is why. If I think of viral inclusion. I should look at BK, CMV, adenovirus. And, and for my mind, from the first slide, it is not viral. My sense is it is cariomegalic and it is of hereditary origin as well. Yeah, okay. I, are you expecting okay. any viral problem here in this patient? No, not really. Uh -huh. Yeah, but we have to do it because yes. uh, we don't yes. see these things every day. So I think uh, just to, be, uh, to complete the studies, we did the CMV, we didn't do any other thing. Uh, of course, uh, it, this case was also... There is a question about way. Fabry, Dr. Hassan. I think it's not yes. Fabry. It uh, doesn't look like Fabry at all. Yes. And the clinic, no, no. there is no the, evidence. The PS stain usually in Fabry, you, you'll find sometimes it will help you and you'll find uh, some uh, type of uh, cytoplasmic uh, staining. Yes. Uh, but... Uh, Okay, so I, we yes, because we, we sent the case for electromicroscopy. That's what that's we have. Why we, yeah. So, so electromicroscopy, we unfortunately, we don't have the pictures. Our, our colleagues, they, they don't send us pictures, but basically I'm reading for you what they have reported. Mild and effacement of the foot processes. Uh, glomerular basic membrane show focal wrinkling and thickening. Mesangium is normal. No electron dense deposits. Their final diagnosis was chronic tubular intestinal nephritis, etiology unknown, no glomerular abnormality. That's electromagnetic. So, so, so it goes with cariomegalic interstitial nephritis. It's interstitial. We know it's an interstitial kidney disease. So Dr. Hassan labeled this as cariomegalic tubular interstitial nephritis with secondary glomerular sclerosis because of the advanced. That's really what we have in this patient. Now, how we proceed I mean, further? I mean, the history is the same because it's a slowly pro progressive renal failure with mild proteinuria. I and mean, this patient is having 1.4 grams of proteins per urine. Uh, glucosuria can be and typically become and glucosuria. I can't recall. Well, this is tubular dysfunction. I will not right. be surprised if there is glucosuria, but it wasn't right. really striking. If they right. the right. major problem, Dr. Yad, that yes. I am thinking in, it is not how to manage the case because we, we will manage the case as chronic kidney disease, chronic, uh, and um, I, I'm, I'm not going with immune suppression, but if the case deteriorated and we need transplantation, Find the donor. Care or not, and if the donor side is yeah, but, but here we will not um, take a kidney from relative definitely unrelated because of the family history of the hereditary disease in the right. family. But I'm, I am afraid of recurrence, and this is a question for Dr. Hassan. What about the, the, the issue of recurrence in cariomegalic interstitial nephritis? About recurrence after transplantation. I, is, is the question addressed to me? Yes, please. I, I, we, we have no experience. With okay. I don't know what you know. Okay. This is, uh, but uh, it depends on the etiology because some of these are associated with okra poisoning. So I guess it depends on the etiology. If it's we don't know the etiology. Is it hereditary or is it related to toxin or something? I have no idea. 
So I don't okay. know if we'll really care or not. Well, yes, okay. Okay. I mean, a sister who is doing very well with the transplant, isn't it? Yes. Yes. So, I mean, still we don't know now if this patient is, I mean, old, uh, I mean, a dominant inheritance pattern or what's going on. I don't know. I haven't got, the, I mean, the clue now about the exact etiology here. Okay, let's Dr. move on. Dr. Riyad, yes, Dr. Go ahead. do you follow the transplant cases, her transplant family? No, really, her, her sister is really not living in because Jordan. Because I'll be very Iraq, interested. I'll be, yes. I'll be very interested to know if there was graft dysfunction and biopsy was carried out to I, see the graft biopsies in this family. I cannot really record okay. that. You know, we don't okay. have that. Okay, go ahead, please. So now, what's really cardiomegalic interstitial nephritis? It's a rare disease, as we hear. It's introduced for the first time in 1979. Okay, usually clinical progressive renal failure third, fourth decade of life. The hallmark of this disease is the presence of these cardiomegalic cells that Dr. Hassan elegantly described. There are extra renal features also can be present, mainly upper respiratory. And the main mechanism, usually it's mitotic block, link it to certain major histocompatibility complexes. As you'll see, I put here nice article 2010. Other potentials, toxins, you know, the Danube area, basically it has been described similar features. Exposure to heavy metals, exotoxins, the orcotoxins, which are prevalent in Balkan area, and viral. And that's why really, you know, I'm not surprised that Dr. Hassan thought about the viral uh, particles and usually he did the study. This disease has no known treatment. And unfortunately, it will progress to end stage kidney disease. Now, more and more recently, we'll come to the genetics. Here it came in now. More recently, the disease has been linked to mutation in the FAN1 gene, Fanconi anemia associated nuclease gene, which is an autosomal recessive pattern of inheritance. <coughs> this gene basically works DNA damage response pathway, particularly in the kidney, and that's usually what happened with such individuals. It's a sad story. Initially, we thought that he came from Iraq after the war and chemicals that had been used really there. You know, it's surprisingly, you know, to have three members of the family having the same disease at different stages of their life. And I came across this article also, and they have 12 families with cardiomegalic interstitial nephritis all describe autosomal recessive pattern, and usually it's basically in the DNA structure repair, which is here the list of the disease. I advise everybody to read this article. It's a very nice review about the cardiomegalic interstitial nephritis. Case report, review of the literature, 2016. It's a beautiful article really to be read. I'll stop here now. Uh, it is very interesting case, uh, Dr. Riyad, um, and uh, um, uh, I was aware because I, I met one, one case and I presented one of the uh, literature cases uh, before. So the, I'm aware of the cardiomegalic interstitial nephritis, but it is rare disease, and I'd like to have the opportunity of uh, presence of Dr. Kosi with us to discuss with him the issue of genetic testing in nephrotic syndrome. Uh, what is the situation, current situation in UK nowadays? He went to do and uh, what to do? Uh, to be honest, uh, it is not, we can't, we can't say it's mandatory. Any patient with nephrotic syndrome who didn't respond to the steroids oh, thank you, uh, bef before the age of 25, mm -hmm. we will send them for routine genetic testing. Okay. Okay, Dr. Kosi. So uh, for adults, you, you don't uh, usually uh, request genetic testing, except if it is- Up to the, as I'm saying, up to the age of 25 years old, oh. if they didn't respond to steroids, uh, particularly F uh, FSGS cases, we send them for the genetic testing. A, for to just to make sure that, because they didn't respond to steroids, to save them, giving them any more steroids or any more immunosuppression, B, to make sure that they are transplantable. So it will not recur in the transplanted kidney. Yes. So that's why we do that uh, genetic studies for these patients. 
in, in children, if it is from the literature, if it is uh, if the if nephrotic appears below one year, or if the nephrotic after one year and the child uh, has some components uh, denoting syndromic uh, pattern, um, these are the indications in pediatric up to this moment. But depends upon the facilities of the presence of genetic testing. Uh, am I, uh, do you agree about this point, Dr. Qusi? Uh, yes, yes. Dr. Mohammed Saeed wants to add uh, some, something here. Dr. Mohammed. Uh, uh, I think uh, the issue here, the very strong family history, uh, it is a point of familiar renal disease. For that, I think genetic analysis from the start uh, might be mandatory, even if there is no issue regarding the response to treatment. The strong family history uh, in the family, uh, it can give us a clue that genetic analysis might be mandatory. Dr. Kosi. Yeah, yeah, this is what I've said. I think we agree the, about this, you know. We need the biopsy with the electron microscopy and the genetic study. Why yeah. the biopsy? Because we will direct the geneticist to see what he's going to look for uh, because of the clinical picture and because of the findings in the biopsy. Then he can concentrate himself or herself on what they are looking for in their genetic analysis. I think the biopsy is the crucial issue in this yeah. patient. Uh, obviously, yes. As you've mentioned now with the, I mean, the, the findings. And even if it's, you have mentioned, that you highlighted the Albert. Obviously the Albert, you might not need any genetic analysis because the electron microscopy will be diagnostic. But it, so, depends I mean, upon, it depends upon the presence of AM. If we don't have AM, yeah. we may have this any way. pattern of injury. And this is why it, it is a complementary issue to have full uh, pathology and um, Sometimes we need that. That's why I'm saying that the electron microscopy, you can diagnose the Alport with the electron microscopy, and you might not need any genetic analysis yes. in, the, okay. in their cases. Okay. I, I think we can go ahead, Dr. Riyad, if, uh, if you don't mind. Okay. Okay. Second, number seven, which is case okay. number three. Okay. This is a 17 year old high school student, smoker from Palestine, admitted to our hospital evaluation of acute kidney injury of one week duration. He was doing relatively well till two weeks prior to admission, developed upper respiratory infection, flu-like, associated three days later with cough and blood sputum. He was given antibiotics there. Fatigue, weakness, decreased urine output was noticed at the end of the week, and the urine became dark brown in color. When seek medical advice, he was told to have renal failure. Initially, dialysis was started there in Palestine via right in central catheter three times weekly. No history of rash, arthritis, mouth ulcer, pleurisy, or passage of stone. No history of non-steroidal use. Young male patient distressed, tachypnic, and afibrile. He's hypertensive, tachycardic, subclavian catheter. In, that's subclavian, not really IJ catheter. Chest X-ray scattered, rack, crackles bilaterally, more on the right side. No bricardia friction rub, normal abdominal exam. Two plus lower limb edema with intact peripheral pulsations, no rash, no joint abnormalities was noted. He's anemic, 8.5 gram or 8.3 grams, platelets white count were on the high side. His are 75, both PT, PTT were normal. His urea, 265 milligram per deciliter, 9.2 milligram creatinine, potassium 6, blood sugar high, calcium, phosphorus, as you noticed. And albumin was. 3.9. His urine analysis, RBCs, red cell cast, white cells view, 3 plus protein, and he has 3.1 gram proteinuria. Chest X-ray showed mild bilateral congestion, no infiltrate. Abdominal ultrasound, normal size kidneys, increased echogenicity, no hydronephrosis, normal liver spleen, and no other pathology. So in summary, this 17-year-old boy, sudden onset of Acute kidney injury following episode of upper respiratory with blood sputum, oliguria, and hematuria. To me, that's what we call lung renal hemorrhage syndrome or lung pulmonary renal syndrome. Urinary findings highly suggestive of acute GN, hematuria, proteinuria, casts, normal kidney size, patient on dialysis. So that's our working diagnosis acute GN, mostly RPGN, with pulmonary renal hemorrhage syndrome. What else now goes in mind? Straightforward case. Yes, Dr. Kosi. 
Uh, I mean, we, I would be interested, to be honest, for the immunology. But I mean, here you can have, as you can say, lung renal hemorrhage syndromes. You can go for the vasculitis issues uh, or anti-GBM. So, uh, but I mean, I'm not sure whether he is aneuric or he was passing still urine. But if he became oligori oligoric, you know, making some urine. Just some urine. And his urine showed red cell casts. So I would be interested for the C3, C4, uh, ANCA, anti-GBM, to see what sort of uh, pathology he is probably expected in the, in the biopsy. And uh, so, this so is the agreement of all the, in the chat writing the same. Okay. Oh. So this is really what I have for you, just to show you, to sum it up, what's renal, renal, lung renal hemorrhage syndrome, that basically constellation of three things, GN on both sides, ANCA related, ANCA related, and anti-GBM antibody, and they cross interact with each other. And in the middle, you have in blue, pulmonary renal syndrome, and that could be GN, could be vasculitis here, ANCA related or whatever we have. So this is the small vessel vasculitis we are talking about, possibly anti-GBM, possibly ANCA related, or definitely we need really to go for serology. Now, Serology, here with we have. You asked about it. hepatitis B, hepatitis C negative, C3, C4 normal, ESR 55, ANA 100, 1 to 180, which is our normal level. Anti DNA is normal, ANCA negative twice, and anti GBM antibody negative twice. Huh. Where we stand? The biopsy is needed. <laughs> Well, this is a pathology conference. <laughs> yes. yeah, definitely we need to have a biopsy. And the cryoglobulin negative. Yes. Uh, I'll tell you, in our place, so basically for the last 20 years, I wish I see a positive one cryoglobulin. Okay. And anyway, the complement was normal anyway. Yes. So, and there's so really, electrophoresis. We, we ruled out, we ruled out here lupus because and yeah. cryos because we have normal complements. Post-infection has been ruled out because of the complements okay. and membranoproliferative, at least, you know, the hypocomplement has been ruled out with this. So still really it's an open thing. It's RPGN by clinical description with negative serology. Also for our experience here uh, for the testing yes. of cryo, always frustrating, always cryo <laughs> because it should be fresh taken by expert hand, and uh, uh, this is why would, we may depend upon the rheumatoid factor rather than um, cryo itself. So for the last 20 years, I cannot recall we have a positive cryo. Dr. Qusi. What yeah, you know, we do the cryo, and obviously, a spe I mean, a specific person who comes to take the sample. And, and it's it is done fresh, fresh by, uh, and yes. Fresh and cold, and just keep it in some ice, uh, uh, certain precautions which okay. obviously he is trained to do it, I have to admit. Because we have a previous experience, uh, cryo-negative in the serum and the classic cryo in the EM. In the so this is why we are frustrated about cryoglobulin. Okay. So that's what we have here in this patient. He was on dialysis basically with that aggressive disease that we have. Here, I think everybody should agree about solubidrol, IV treatment, other supportive management, and we biopsied him next morning. The CT of the chest, Dr. Yad, because Dr. What? Saeed, CT of the we chest. Did, no, we did not do really CT of the chest. Uh, the, because the chest X-ray, chest X-ray. Chest X-ray, we have it. There are congestion. Very, Just mentioned the congestion only, but no infiltrate. Is it? No infiltrate, and there is no cavitation. We don't cavitation. really see yeah. any cavitation. Yeah. Okay. So the biopsy, 21 glomeruli, we have on the light and seven on the immune fluorescence. Dr. Hassan, the floor is yours. Dr. Hassan? Dr. Hassan? Okay, well, I don't know. Where is Dr. Hassan? What? He's on mute. So, uh, what? Can you ask him to unmute himself, please? Okay. Dr. Hassan. So, yes. uh, this is low power. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Just show you that there is a good number of glomeruli here. We cannot say much about this. Uh, okay. 
even at this power, you can see that uh, this uh, glomerulus, uh, there is a cellular crescent here. Please use uh, is... the cursor, Dr. Riyad, help him. Yes, I'm using it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The cares, uh, the, this is a cellular crescent and the glomerulus here is a little bit collapsed. Uh, and you can see there is interstitial edema a little bit. Uh, there are many uh, red blood cell casts in the tubules. You can see them here and here and here and here. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Again, uh, this is a slide mostly, it is a cellular crescent here replacing most of the glomerulus. And uh, okay, that, that's okay. Uh, and you can see the red blood cell casts and some structural uh, loss here. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? There is a very nice cellular crescent here, and I think, I think this is the first glomerulus that we saw. There is mild increase in mesangial cells and matrix here, and there are red cell casts in the tubules. Uh, again, this is a crescent here, and this is what is left of the glomerulus, and there are foci of necrosis in the crescent. And this is fibrinoid material, okay? And some, okay, again, this is mostly uh, the crescent is here, cellular crescent, and uh, this is what is left of the glomerulus compressed to the uh, space of, uh, surrounded by Bowman's capsule. And these are probably, no, these are uh, tubules. They're, they don't have casts in them. And there are some exudated neutrophils. You can see them here and here, some neutrophils within the glomerulus as well as in the uh, crescent. Same thing, necrosis in the crescent with the cellular casts, with the cellular crescent with necrosis, and this is the glomerulus here, and the neutrophils here and scattered. Uh, the next one, again, looks. this is necrosis in the cellular crescent. This glomerulus is more or less normal, actually. But there are a few uh, neutrophils exudated here and there. So, can we go to the next one? Next slide, Dr. Ria. Yeah, what about this? Look about this nice crescent here that we have. You see it, Sam? Yeah, this is a PS stain. Yeah. This is a PS stain just to show you the, the contrast between the what is left of the glomerulus and the crescent, which goes around the whole uh, glomerulus. And uh, uh, no necrosis in this one, actually. Can we go to the next one? So this is a, a mass and trichrome and uh, you can see the fibrinoid material in the crescent here, and this is what's left of the glomerulus. And actually, the, the, the capillary loops are not thickened uh, in most of this, uh, what's left of the glomerulus here. But you can see there may be some uh, uh, necro also necrosis here. Mass and trichrome is very nice. It shows the fibrinoid material, fibrinoid necrosis very well, and it uh, separates it from the rest of the uh, crescent, which will be like bluish in color, but the fibrinoid material will be pinkish. Next slide. So, okay. So uh, we sorry, have... Can, uh, sorry, can I interrupt you here? Uh, yes. Have we got any immunofluorescence at all, just to see whether there is... Pussy we will come, we'll come to that. I see, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah we'll come to that. Sorry for interruption, sorry. <laughs> okay, so really you have on the light microscopy, almost 15 out of the 22 glomeruli with crescents. So that really fulfilled the criteria of crescentic GM. Now what it is, now the immune fluorescence. Now we have to entertain, you know, we have negative ANCA, we have negative anti-GBM antibody, we have normal complements. So it's going to be one type one, type two, or type three. We don't know here, it's a nice, 
talk of, from Dr. John Feely, you know, at one time in Jordan, you immune deposits, linear, pausy immune or granular, and that's really how you go with it, with the differential diagnosis. And that's basically what you're going to see. This is the linear stain, which is anti-GBM. This is the type two, the granular, granular capillary and usually cryos or lupus or line and type 3 when you see nothing what we call pausy immune that's after professor Kauser again so really that's what you expect and that's why immune fluorescence is mandatory in such patients okay this is our patient yeah. Now, as you can see this linear igg deposits and capillary loops very nice very beautiful and uh, Clearly, it is anti-GBM. Oh. OK. Very I'll stop clear. here now. So now the question is, twice anti-GBM antibody is negative. Any patient highly suspect with RPGN with positive immune fluorescence, linear staining. And where we go? What are we going to do? Any comments? Dr. Kosi? Uh, to be honest, I can see that it is a classic clinically and uh, histopathologically anti-GBM disease. Yes. So I will just go as a treatment of anti-GBM disease. So I'll just go for the plasma exchange even and for everything just to see and the immunosuppression and see how it goes with this patient. And I will be very concerned that he might have any uh, uh, alveolar infiltrate with the uh, hemoptysis um, so we we do need the plasma exchange and we do need the immunosuppression, even if we have got the anti-GBM negative. Dr. Hunaymet? Um, we definitely agree with Dr. Qazi, even if the anti-GBM is negative. With this immunofluorescence, definitely, as um, I, I'll, I'll go for plasma exchange. I'll, I'll treat as anti-GBM. Can I highlight one point here, yes, please? Yes, please. please Dr. Clearly, this patient is on dialysis. The prognosis for the kidney will be very poor with this anti-GBM. Probably he will not recover the kidney function, maybe, but the plasma exchange even because of the pulmonary hemorrhages. Okay. I, I think the uh, ANCA is, uh, so long as ANCA is negative, we are dealing with anti-GBM disease. If anti-GBM disease is associated with pulmonary hemorrhage, plasma exchange, as you mentioned, is indicated. Right. Well, definitely there is no ANCA yes. because this is a very nice yes. linear scale. Very nice, very nice. Yeah. And the key message from this case is... Dr. Hassan really is working on all yeah, this. Yeah. Yeah. Immune fluorescence is mandatory because sometimes we find um, uh, for a, a reason or, a, or other, uh, the pathology showing crescentic and no immune fluorescence in some cases, in some areas. So uh, please, immune fluorescence is the gate to both differential diagnosis as clearly demonstrated by Dr. Riyadh. Without immune fluorescence, we are paralyzed. We have nothing. Even if anti-GBM is negative in the blood, we may find it clearly present in the tissue. So- Dr. Saeed Al-Ghamdi with us? Yes, Dr. Al-Ghamdi. Can we hear from him? Yes, please, Dr. Saeed. Assalamu alaikum. Very alaykum. interesting case to have actually uh, the uh, anti-GBM disease with uh, negative serology, but uh, I must say that only 60% to 70% of the cases of uh, anti-GBM, they have positive serology. Serology, yes. So, yes. so, negative, serol so negative serology does not rule out anti-GBM. And we do have uh, sometimes uh, cases where we'll, in the beginning they will have actually negative uh, anti-GBM antibodies. And in this case, as Dr. Kossi said, I will treat like anti-GBM disease with uh, everything. But putting in mind that the recovery of kidney function is less than 10% in this case. According to all studies, anti-GBM, when they go to dialysis, the likelihood of uh, recovering kidney function with uh, whatever measure you will do is probably very uh, minuscule. So that's my comment about it. Thank you very much. I agree with you, Dr. Ghamdi. Dr. Mohammed Saeed, do you like to add a point? Uh, I agree with Professor uh, and have, Professor Ramli. Uh, uh, the issue that uh, uh, if the patient is more than four weeks on dialysis, I think the only line of treatment is the TBE for the pulmonary hemorrhage, but there is no need for heavy immunosuppression because there is no recovery. So we have to be very careful if our patient more than four weeks, no need for steroid, no need for sacrosamide, just to only plasma exchange for uh, the pulmonary hemorrhage. But immunosuppression, no effect. 
with this oh. kind of young age, 19, 17 year old. You we can give him a trial, a trial if he is in Daesh from two to four weeks. But more than four weeks, the is, okay. I think, I think the, for this young patient who will do- I'll go full okay. scale therapy. Yes. Right. yes. Yes. And particularly, we would like to transplant this patient at some yes. point. And we would like okay. the tater of the anti, obviously we don't have any tater for the anti-GBM. Now, if let's you... say, you know, we, we know that good pastor syndrome, anti-GBM antibodies, when we treat them with plasma freezes, we have parameters to follow, to follow their titers. Here we are in the dark. Yes. Any comment? I think, I think we will treat the situation uh, and we don't have serology and we will not do biopsy to repeat to, the, to see the so disappearance clinical, of clinical. Basically clinical follow-up. Clinical, yes. and even if the kidney doesn't improve and it doesn't recover, it will depend upon the pulmonary hemorrhage and the pulmonary symptoms when you are treating systemic disease. Okay, let's go. I think all what you mentioned, my colleagues, we undertook this basically. So the hallmark, basically, as you hear, anti-GBM antibody is the patognomonic feature, but look about 10% of patients, at least, they have no circulating antibodies. You cannot detect it. So serology testing should not be the only diagnostic criteria and kidney biopsy is a must for such patients. And I put for you here a good number of articles. They are talking about good bastard syndrome in absence circulating anti-GBM antibodies. Here, another article, again, 2010, another article in pulmonary medicine, 2014, and another article all described. So it's not really a unique thing that we don't have. Yes, it's there, it's present in the literature. And I recall one time, Dr. Richard Glassick, in fact, we were in Cairo, and this case I think was presented there. And he mentioned the sink effect, the sink effect of yes. in the kidney. Okay, so you have the, the, the kidney is taking the whole plant, all anti-GBM anti, but the antibodies are really in the kidney, left nothing there to be detected in the serum. In addition, depends upon the method that you are using, whether ELISA or really right. other methods that you are using. So that's basically, you know, concerning, yes, we have to rely mostly on the kidney biopsy. How we treated this patient, okay, Steroid therapy, cyclophosphamide, plasmapheresis is the golden standard for such patient. He received plasmapheresis daily for three days, and then every other day, total 10 sessions, he improved. Hemodialysis was stopped after four sessions, seen later on, three months after that, with serum creatinine 1.7 milligram per deciliter. It well, he went back to Palestine. I don't have further follow-up on this individual. But that's how we manage this patient. He received cyclo because of the lung legions, plasmapheresis, and fortunately, he was lucky to really get him reversed from his disease. And at least we saved his kidneys. I don't know for how long and what happened to him later on. If I am not the treating physician, if I am the treating physician, I will do the same. Except that I'm, I'm going to do CT scan for this case to be sure that there's no consolidation, nothing more uh, before giving cyclophosphamide for this case. Dr. Qusi, what about CT in your clinic? Uh, we do a high resolution CT, yes. for just, I mean, the, the alveolar hemorrhages, just to yes. verify, particularly he presented with hemoptysis, this chap, and it will give us the uh, support for the uh, plasma exchange straight away. Um, I mean, then the cyclophosphamide as well. Okay. So it will give, I mean, to support our decision in terms of the cyclo and the plasma exchange. Although, to be honest, I have to admit, even if I haven't got any facility for the CT, I will go for the whole uh, therapy here, plasma exchange, cyclo for The somebody. same, yes. yes. Yeah. You know, this is the typical uh, example, you know, so we, during training, used to still tell you where you have a patient presented like this, Friday night that's in the state, Friday night, and you have no access really for biopsy, for any serology, just treat like this. Treat like this, initiate therapy, overshoot, not to under, really uh, under treat such patients. To be honest, what is interesting me here is the response to immunosuppression. Yes. And he has recovered the good, uh, I mean, being off dialysis. And the question is, 
those who have got, I mean, negative uh, serology, are they doing better? I don't know. The I don't know. <laughs> but don't the, know. the theory of sinking, sink, uh, that the kidney absorb all antibodies, it, it is valid. And I'm not, um, I, I will not pay any attention to the negative serology because yeah. even I don't request antigen in the blood, I depend totally on the biopsy. For, uh, I think for, we are lucky enough here. Yeah, okay. I think okay. our biopsy, we will do it today, next morning. By 10 o'clock, we have the light microscopy. And by noontime, most of the time, we have the immune fluorescent. So basically, less than 24 hours after the kidney biopsy, we have our results available. So a full, a, full, a full agreement and, and congratulations for Dr. Hassan for this very nice work. Dr. Tarzan Tawi? Uh, yes, happy end, and I'm very, very, very happy from that uh, happy end, and this lucky patient who has the optimal care in the proper time. Congratulations for your effort, okay. and happy end for our patient. Uh, the, the, here, there is a question from Dr. Fouad about uh, the without NGBM, when is it safe to transplant if needed? For my mind, uh, uh, if, uh, if I'm going to answer this question, if this is a rapid uh, progressive glomerulonephritis, whatever ANCA positive or negative, it's better to wait for a year after, yes. after yes. the treatment. Dr. Kosi. Yes, yes, usually we, this is the case. Even yes. if, you, if you have, a, I mean, and this is good uh, indicator for ourselves that we don't have a serology. Yes. So we don't have anything to rely on, to be honest, except the duration. And usually we wait for at least a year prior to considering for the transplant. Okay. I agree. Dr. Mohammed Saeed wants also to interact here. Dr. Mohammed Saeed, for short comment. Uh, congratulations for the reversal. And just to mention, once anti-GBM recovered, either partially or completely, it doesn't recur. So it is not a recurrent disease. So if we succeeded to you remove mean, you, the mean, you mean in transplant patients, in, uh, after transplantation, or for the patient to, be, to have recurrent episodes of activity? For the patient to have recurrent episodes of activity, it is only one hit. It comes once and very rarely to recur. So if the keratin came back I, to 1.7... I am not aware by this statement. And I don't question, think so. And he the should question, stop smoking. Yeah. One thing really, he should stop smoking. And it is aggravating factor. Smoking, yeah, smoking is a true, smoke, but it but, doesn't need but maintenance is, like Dr. others. Muhammad, Dr. Muhammad, uh, there is a difference between the treatment is okay, the patient recovered uh, altogether, and I was drawing immune suppression, and your statement, it doesn't recur again. Dr. Rukosi. Uh, yes, usually we, I mean, for the anti-GBM cases, I mean, yes. this patient is very lucky, obviously. And I mean, once uh, we have got the patient with anti-GBM, uh, first of all, it's a rare a disease. Uh, once we have got him positive for anti-GBM and on dialysis, we are not expecting any recovery of the kidney function. And we usually wait for the anti-GBM titer to go down below 15 on most of the cases. Uh, and or minimum one year uh, post the uh, last episode to just considering for transplant. The question, is it chronic recurring disease? I think it is. No, it's it is not. Recurring. Uh, it, is it, not. Can. it can recur yeah. because the statement okay. of Dr. Mohammed Said, I don't agree about it, that it is never, never to occur. It is one hit. An uh, unusual, and unusual. That's why, I, and that's why we are keeping the patient on immune separation for the pulmonary hemorrhage, even if they are on dialysis. Yes. Let Doctor, me tell you, we have an experience with another patient, really, more or less the same. That patient, luckily, unluckily, really, he could not really improve. His kidney function deteriorated, continued dialysis. We transplanted him, basically, after, I'll say, eight months, because levels were undetectable at that point in time. The kidney lived with him for 14 years, and he came later on with... Lost, he lost his kidney, we biopsied that kidney, and there was no evidence of anti-GBM antibody in the transplanted kidney that he lost. And then we transplanted him a second kidney, and he's doing great. So uh, the, the statement is uh, recurrence is rare, or aggravation of the disease is rare once, once responded. But yes. I, I, I don't have the power to say it is zero to be aggravated again. Oh, no, unusual. unusual. It's unusual, yes. 
Do you want to add Do you like to add any point here before? Uh, أبداً, أبداً. I would agree. Very it's nice. unusual, very unusual to recur, but it can. But I like this case even more than karyomegalic interstitial nephritis because <laughs> it is it's a, teach, a teaching case. A teaching yes. Okay, case. I think the take-home message from sure. this case, please, you know, it's not mandatory Biopsy. to have positive anti-GBM antibody. Right. You should really treat based on your kidney biopsy. That's the home take message. Yes, and if we do biopsy, we should do everything, do immune fluorescence. Without immune fluorescence, the biopsy is so insufficient. Okay. And Dr. So, Dr. Yasser El Mullah? Many thanks. Uh, sorry, I joined mid of the case because I was like, in, did misinterpret the timing of the excellent session. So I'm aware that the practice is different from one place to another. In terms of the transplantation at the Hammersmith Royal Free and Edinburgh, it used to be a year, as yes. mentioned by yes. Professor Al Kusi, but recently in 2017, they've cut that down to six months. I'm not sure about how solid the evidence for that, and I'm sure there is no solid evidence for it, but it used to be one year as mentioned, but now they are doing it for six months. In terms of the negative serology, the usual ELISA only check the IgG1 anti-GPM, but there are subclass of IgG4 as mentioned by one of the paper of Professor Alan Salama from the Royal Free. So now for, we have a couple of cases like this where anti-GPM is proven on the biopsy with a negative ELISA anti-GPM. So we used to send these samples free of charge to be processed in the Denmark, and I'm happy to arrange any samples to be sent from Arabic countries, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, for free to be processed in Denmark, and they do test for the subclasses of the anti-GPM, including the IgG4, uh, so that's of interest as well. And again, I missed the early part of the case, but we have a, a vague protocol here that if any patient is coming with a renal involvement only, and they are on uric at the time of presentation with anti-GPM only, with no evidence of lung involvement, we don't do a biopsy, we don't immune suppress them. And if they are AKI passing some urine and we do a biopsy, and I'm talking about kidney involvement only without any extra renal manifestation, and the biopsy is showing 100% crescent, again, the decision here is not to do any immune suppression, no plasma exchange. So these two conditions, when they're on uric at the time of presentation, no biopsy, or if it's stage three AKI and they are still passing urine, we do a biopsy, 100% crescent, we don't give any immune suppression and we just wait for the kidney to burn itself uh, while on dialysis waiting for six months. I'm talking in absence of pulmonary hemorrhage. And we had, in the last 10 years, we did audits for the cases of the recurrence of the anti-GPM. And we had seven cases in total who had recurrence of the anti-GPM, uh, despite that it's well known to be a one head disease. Excellent case and happy end, as everyone said. And sorry, Dr. I just yes, Dr. really, yes. you know, if I allow me, Dr. Hussein, yeah, okay. you know, I don't, I disagree really. You know, even if the patient makes very little urine yeah. and the patient really young and we have crescent formation, I will not let him go. I will give him the best chance to recover his kidney function. So and this, I think this it is, is unfair. It is unfair just to say let him go, let the kidney burn out, and then we transplant him after six months. I think we owe our patient really, you know, the way to treat them, hopefully, without complicating their life. Thank you very so, much. Sorry, Prof. Yeah, I only yes. said if, if there are 100% crescent. Excuse me, Dr. Yasser is working in Edinburgh Hospital, and this is a very respected uh, center, but I agree with Dr. Yad Saeed, if we have a young a patient with, even if he is aneuric, I'm going to do biopsy. Even if I don't, I don't give immune suppression because of chronicity and no systemic, no pulmonary hemorrhage. This is another, this other point. If, is, uh, but biopsy, it, it, it is indicated. Regarding six months, do you mean six months for NGBM disease or rapid progressive glomerulonephritis in general? I'm talking about the anti-GPM and the anchor. Oh, it used uh, to be one no, year. Because last, in the last December, there is in the American Journal of Kidney Disease 2020, a core curriculum for rabbit for anchor uh, associated glomerulonephritis and they written uh, they, there was uh, one year one year this is no evidence based recommendation but it is the common agreement to wait for a year before proceeding to transplantation I fully agree, and that used to be the case till 2017, okay. when Prof. Jane and Prof. Salama changed it to six months. And as I said, I don't think there is a strong evidence for that. Thank I you think very six much. Six months is okay. That's exactly. Thank you, you very much. Six Dr. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Yasser, for your very nice comment. But I, I, I agree with Dr. Yasser that I'm going to do biopsy, even if the if the patient is anuric. 
uh, even if I decide at the end not to give excessive immune suppression, but it is our role as nephrologists to do that for, especially for young patients. Okay, okay Dr. Uh, Dr. Riyad, does Okay, present the last doctors, case, it will be no, short. Excuse me, before. there is a question here in the chat for yes. you, Dr. Riyad and Dr. Kosi. Does the percent of um, crescents give a clue about prognosis and uh, uh, whenever to give immune suppression or not? To be honest, I mean, it is uh, Dr. Riyad Basha, I think you want to comment on your comment. I think the, if the if uh, if if crescents exceed eighty uh, percent and the circumferential, this predict poorer prognosis. We have, but, yes. but you give the patient a chance. Yes, that's my yes. point. Yes. We have got. I mean, usually in the pathology and uh, and the, I mean, uh, Dr. Said can just I mean uh, correct ourselves if we are wrong. They say that for the anti-GBM disease because it is a, a head a single head disease. The age of the <laughs> presence in the biopsy, all of them will be the same, nearly the same. You will don't, not like the ANCA positive vasculites, you can have different ages of the crescents. For the anti GBM, yes. all of them they will be the same. So the percentage it is definitely 100%. Yes, I'm not expecting that much. And it, clinically, he will be anuric, and clinically, he will be on dialysis, these patients. Uh, and we usually we don't pick them up that early. Usually they come when they have got burn. I mean, most of the uh, the glomeruli have been affected, and will be uh, will be basically not really cellular, maybe fibrocellular crescent. Okay, Doctor Saeed Al Ghandi. Uh, thank you very much, and I agree that that uh, those cases are rare to recur. But uh, I can remember one case similar to Prof uh, Riyad Saeed case, where she had actually that positive serology, and I remember she has a very good caring father, and he's seen her. Uh, uh, antibodies going up uh, and then he uh, was telling me and then I said well let's wait 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 until the patient develop pulmonary hemorrhage so recurrence do the care despite they've been on dialysis and uh, so uh, they need actually to be observed because the recurrence is there and I agree with Prof. Say to and I think see the good result he has with his aggressive management of uh, RBGN thank you very much I want to add only the one point. If we, even if we are dealing with ANCA associated vasculitis, it's better to test NGBM because one of the indications to, yeah, yeah, it's one of the clear indication of plasmapheresis in the presence of positive anti-GBM uh, associated with ANCA. Okay, Dr. Hunaymat, can okay. we go? We'll go. Let us go to the last case. Hello, yes, yes, sure. Yes. Yes, Dr. Yad, Fadalabash. Okay, well, this is again, uh, this is a change of pace, an elderly, you know, 69 female patient admitted for our hospital evaluation of upper abdominal pains with mild moderate flank pains for the last five days prior to admission. This was associated with vomiting, diarrhea for nearly three days and decreased urine output. No hematemesis, no melina, no hematuria, or burning sensation and fever. Serum creatinine was found to be 3.5. And that's why nephrology was consulted. General fatigue, poor appetite, nearly eight, you know, eight kilo weight loss in the past month, history of hypertension for nearly 15 years, mild renal functional impairment for two years. He mentioned that in the record, creating 1.4 milligram per deciliter. She was maintained on the following medication, Codiovan, which is Valsartan. Uh, this is one... Uh, 50, 160, 25, uh, Bicor, which is uh, Concor, calcium carbonate, and omeprazole. That's her medication when she came in. The patient looked tired, exhausted, not in acute distress. She's pale with evidence of dehydration. The blood pressure was 148, 50, that's really supine. And sitting blood pressure 130, 70, heart rate 68, and uh, uh, regular uh, and febrile abdominal examination, tenderness all over the abdomen, history of mostly in the epigastric area, no organomegaly, both kidneys are not palpable, no ascites, bladder was empty, no lower limb edema, peripheral pulsations were intact. And that's her chemistry when we have, you know, from her record, uh, a year earlier, we have creatinine here, 1.47, and then also in January 19, 2019, there's 1.36, and we came to us 
3.5. So basically, it's a rise in serum creatinine, hemoglobin from 12.6 down to 10, and potassium, as you'll see here, this the rest of the chemistry, and she's more acidotic. Her urine analysis showed few white cells, urid cells, one plus protein, and she has only 0.6 gram proteinuria. Her amylase was elevated, lipase was high, and LDH. So she has evidence of pancreatitis. ANAs, hepatitis B, hepatitis C or negative, and she has normal complements with ESR of 21. The kidneys here, any thoughts really, what's going on with this patient? So the, the presence of pancreatitis may refer to a clue that is even Dr. Khaled Abu Zaid wrote on the chat, maybe IgG4 related disease. So I'm eager to know the ultrasound and the others or the, the rest of investigation. Dr. Kosi. Yeah, yeah, I'm just waiting for the rest of the investigations. Because yes. The pain. yes, that's what we have so far. Yeah, okay. No, no, I'm, I'm just asking about the uh, imaging. Yes. Okay, the imaging. Yeah. Please. What do you expect? Here is the imaging. <laughs> Both kidneys are bulky in size, show lobulated contour with increased parenchymal echogenicity, right kidney 14 centimeter, left kidney 13, fullness is noted, right collecting system, AB diameter, renal pelvis, 1.3 centimeter. Bancreas is thickened, moderately homogeneous, head of pancreas measure 3.5 centimeter, multiple cystic abnormalities involving pancreas seen in the head, body, and tail. Features keeping with pancreatitis. That's what really did. And she has gold bladder stones. I, I think the differential diagnosis, the ultrasound helps us here to put differential diagnosis. It's large okay. kidneys. So, uh, uh, Dr. Kosa, do you like to uh, no, 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 yeah, carry on? on the uh, no, 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 I don't, I don't like that. I, Hussein, don't comment, Hussein. Okay, hadr. Samar Ata. You'd like me to comment <laughs> myself. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Saeed Khamis uh, wrote IgG4. What else? Dr. Saeed, but the, the kidneys are large. I'm not sure if uh, IgG4 related disease is associated with large kidneys. It will be associated with a cocktail of manifestation, including riddle thyroiditis, cholangitis, ATC. But large kidneys, I think it is not famous with IgG4 related disease to find large kidneys. Uh, is there any differential diagnosis for, for large kidneys with renal failure? The amyloid can give a large kidney. Yes. What else? I think amyloid, yes, we have proteinuria. But what the relation between amyloid and pancreatitis that we have here? Is there is any relation? Uh, Dr. Bassam Khedr uh, uh, wrote large kidney sometimes like tumor in IgG4. It's okay. Um, uh, so uh, tumor, okay, is a... Uh, to be put in mind. Okay. What else? Anybody? Fine. Let's move on if this okay. is the case. Okay. So, our clinical diagnosis was here we have pancreatitis, uh, gallbladder disease could be related, acute kidney injury on top of CKD because really uh, pre renal due to pancreatitis, post renal there was no obstruction. Is it really GN? Is it ATN? Is it interstitial? Or it is infiltrate as we heard read from Dr. Alcosi about amyloid. Okay, now here what we have. Our kidney functions start getting worse and worse. Serum creatinine is going up. Supportive care for pancreatitis. Hydration with nasogastric suction. No improvement of kidney function. She was given steroid therapy because of large kidneys in condition that could be, you know, just quote unquote, we infiltrative disease if there is anything or I doubt really amyloid, a drug induced. We don't know what medication she has. And then she's scheduled for both upper endoscopy and kidney biopsy on the same day. So. Can, can I comment here to be honest? Yes. I'm not sure about the steroid therapy without having a clear indication for a patient who has got pancreatitis. I'm not entirely sure. If I were in this position, I will wait until I get any information from the biopsy to give me some indication or encourage to, uh, to just go for the steroid, to be honest. This is the same that I do because we have uh, uh, the background is chronic kidney disease and the biopsy is mandatory to know where we are. 
and the yeah. pancreatitis yeah. as well. I'm not sure about the, I mean, still we don't know what's going on. So a biopsy is in the highly indicated. And the, I believe that one day waiting for the steroid or a couple of days waiting will not make a huge problem to the kidney function. You what know, about this patient, this patient GFR, just at her age and with this degree of renal function, it's just less than 10. She's going to be on dialysis. Basically, yeah. she's a dialysis candidate by this time. Do we have CT scan, Dr. Riyad? CT scan of what? For, of the abdomen for the pancreas, necrotizing pancreatitis? Or yes, yeah. or ultrasound. Patient? That's only ultrasound. Why you don't like CT scan? <laughs> You'd like to do it with enhancement? No, I, I, mean, I mean, any patient comes with the acute pain. <laughs> we go for CT. We go from the A and D to CT scan straight away. You know, it's the easier of the two. It's the easier of the ultrasound to me was really helping a lot. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah, okay. Dr. So, Dr. Matt wants to see. add a comment to Dr. Ghanaymet. Unmute yourself, Abash. I am Mohammed. Unmute, unmute, Dr. Ghanaymet. Unmute, Edot, unmute. I'm not sure what happened. Unmute, Abash. يكون نام كان تكست لا اوكي خلاص انا ض... اضغط ان ميوت يا دكتور محمد اوكي دكتور رياض كمل حضرتك اوكي سو اند ذن وي هاف ذا بايوبسي اند هير از دكتور حسان دكتور حسان ار يو ويز اس يس ام ويز يو اوكي بليز ويل Unfortunately, we didn't have many glomeruli in this case. Uh, this is one of them, and it looks like it's almost uh, sclerosed. But if you look even at this low power, there is an infiltrate in this kidney. Can we have the other slide? The next one, Dr. Riyad? Yeah, I have it for you. Yeah, okay, because, uh, yeah, as you can see, this is the glomerulus, which is partially sclerosed, and there is periglomerular fibrosis. But look at these uh, blue, small blue round cells infiltrating the interstitium and uh, separating and compressing the renal tubules. Uh, so the, uh, uh, this power, I think they look like lymphoid cells. And here is the higher power. It shows you definitely these are lymphoid cells. They are small to, me to intermediate size. Some of them are small, some of them intermediate in size. And uh, this is glomerulus, which is partially or uh, sclerosed, and uh, there's periglomerular fibrosis. And you see the tubules are compressed by these cells. They are expanding the interstitium. And uh, another view just showing the same type of cells. The nuclei, the cytoplasm is very little. The nuclei are variable, and uh, they are regular in shape. I think in the next uh, slides, we'll see better morphology of the nuclei and the can. Okay, just see, to show you the, uh, the uh, trophic uh, small tubules and the internal infiltrate here, and these are trophic tubules uh, compressed by the infiltrate. The next slide, Victoria. Can you have the next? Yeah. Okay. Can you, you can see here that there is a lot of variation in the size of these uh, cells, lymphoid cells. Uh, some of them are medium sized, large, but they are regular in shape. This uh, this uh, kidney shape like uh, nucleus, and uh, they don't have prominent nucleoli. Uh, the chromatin pattern is dense. So this is an infiltrate. Uh, it could be either lymphoma or leukemia. And that's why the CT scan will be very important here. <laughs> Probably the CT scan okay. will tell us something about the I mean about the lymph node enlargement. If there is any lymph node enlargement, which obviously will not be picked up by the ultrasound. I'm hiding something from you later on. I will show it to you. Right. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm hiding something from you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay. Go on. Yes. So we did some immune markers. And as yes. you can see, this is a CD20, which is a B cell marker. And yes. all of these cells are staying and taking the B cell stain. Yes. So yes. we are dealing with a B cell lymphoma in this case. Yes. Can we have the next slide, Dr. Riyad? Yes, I have it for you. Okay. That's CD10 now. 
And this is CD10, which indicates that this, uh, these B lymphocytes are of germinal center origin. Uh, the CD10 is a marker for the germinal centers. And they are positive as well. And uh, the, yeah, we did some other immune markers. Can you see them, Dr. Young? Yeah, that's a CD3. Which is a T cell marker. And you can only see a few reactions. T cells here which are taking the brown stain, but these cells are all negative. There's no staining. So we this is a B cell neoplasm actually. And uh, we did uh, uh, the next slide, uh, I think. KI67. KI67, yeah. yeah, which is a proliferative index, uh, very high. Almost all the cells, uh, this is almost 100% uh, positive staining of the nuclear for KI67, which is indicative of and a very aggressive type of lymphoma, actually. We did other immunostains also. Uh, can we have the next slide, Dr. Rian? Yes. Okay, so we did CD5 negative, CD30 negative. We did TDT. TDT is a marker for lymphoblastic lymphoma, which is negative also. Uh, did also some other stains like uh, I did the uh, IgM and uh, we did BCL2 and they were also negative. So actually this profile does not really fit with specific type of B-cell lymphoma. Ah, yes, we had the bone marrow also biopsy and uh, it was negative. These are all normal hematopoietic cells, including some megakaryocytes. There was no infiltration of the bone marrow. Next one. Can I have the next one, Victoria? No, I don't. That's it. And we have the duodenal biopsy, endoscopy. It's exactly the same findings yes. as has been reported as what we have in the kidney. Okay. So why did the biopsy, Dr. Yeah. Endoscopy, when they did the endoscopy, because thickening of oh. the duodenum, as I mentioned to you in the ultrasound, okay. thickened wall of the duodenum, we did our endoscopy to see where we stand and our endoscopy took a biopsy but and the biopsy it, find it, it exactly is difficult the it's difficult to see the duodenum by ultrasound so to, well, it's there you know that's what has been reported you know okay. i'm not an uh, ultrasonographer <laughs> but that's really you know so you what do has been reported you do endoscopy and you don't do ct scan <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. Yes. Okay. No, no, okay. No, the CT scan will be done soon now for staging. <laughs> yes. I'm sure that it will be it's done about... now for staging. Okay. <laughs> now, so basically, our final diagnosis, Dr. Hassan labeled this as high grade B cell lymphoma, non feature to be. Otherwise, no... or not otherwise uh, specified. Uh, actually, uh, we, uh, it is not a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma because uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphomas usually they don't have this variation in size and shape and this high proliferative index. And actually we didn't do all, this should have, uh, we needed some uh, in, uh, molecular testing because I, I'm, I'm thinking that this probably could be left retrospectively. It could be what we call now double hit lymphoma where you have MIC translocation as well as BCL2 translocation. I don't know, we didn't do these things, but I, I believe that this is very aggressive, high grade BCL lymphoma. Okay. Now, what information, other information you need? We have the biopsy, we got the biopsy, we got the diagnosis, and then we are lucky enough to have, you know, ask the family to bring some other information because we have chronic kidney disease in this patient to start with a year ago or six months earlier with serum creatine 1.7. I'd like to show you how this patient behaved after treatment. You know, gradual improvement of her kidney function from high five down to 2.3. And then family decide to take her with this diagnosis to King Hussein Medical Center, which is our cancer institute in Amman. So they for further management and taking care of this patient. So really our role with this patient just ended here with serum creatine 2.3, not different much really from what we have was six months earlier. Then I got some information back. I'll show it to you. When she has serum creatine in 1.36, 1.4, that was the surprise for us. This is her ultrasound, small kidneys, small kidneys, that's the right and the left kidney. 
it's eight point centimeter and seven point centimeter. That's her kidneys in June, uh, in I'll say 2018. And then when she came to us, this is her kidneys, huge kidneys. So this, with that clinical picture, small kidneys, renal disease around 1.5 or so, then massively doubled the size of the kidneys that came to us most likely to me as infiltrative disease. The only thing we'll do that is lymphoma. And that's why really we start treatment on this patient. And then after therapy, we melted the tumor basically. Basically, look about the size of the kidneys after therapy. The kidney size came down to 10. So that's really the little things that I was hiding from you gentlemen. Dr. Mohsen. And I, I, I just, just say something interesting. Because yes. I've got a similar case uh, for, uh -huh. 20, for 28 years old lady presented with the historical creatinine entirely normal a couple of years before she presented to us. And when she came in, she came with a creatinine of 650 and she was pale and anemic. Um, uh, we haven't got any chemistry within the last two years. And when we did the immunology, all the immunology negative, including serum electrophoresis, because sometimes those patients can develop some paraproteinemia. Yes. Uh, we have done the ultrasound scan. The ultrasound scan showed atrophic left kidney, but the right kidney was around 13 centimeter. And the question was for the patient, might be a bit risky to biopsy this single kidney. Yes. But I mean, we just have a discussion with the patient. What do you think about going for the biopsy? And there is a risk to lose the kidney altogether. Uh, and she said that, okay, I'm going ahead to know what the cause of the, I mean, of the acute kidney injury. We don't know whether this is acute or not, because as I'm saying, we didn't have any history within the last two years for the uh, kidney function. So we did the kidney biopsy and clearly came back to be infiltration was B-cell lymphoma. And the question was straight away from the hematology, can we please have the CT scan just for staging to know where this lympho lymph node's been involved? Unfortunately, this patient ended up in dialysis and for the last two years, she's still dialysis dependent and uh, she didn't respond to the chemotherapy, including the rituximab because she's CD20 positive, but she didn't respond to the rituximab. And they are thinking about now of experimental approach of the, uh, sorry, B cell uh, transplantation, something I fan fancy. I don't know about the hematology. So it is interesting, I mean, case, but it is rare cases to be honest, but you need to think about it. It is there really, you know, the message that really was sudden change in the kidney size any patient who came with this picture, I think was on the top of my differential at that point in time, large infiltrative cell. disease, uh -huh. lymphoma. We have a couple of cases of large cell lymphoma and the key was larger kidneys by ultrasound with acute renal failure profile. So we learned it a lot that we, we should respect the differential diagnosis. And even if the biopsy, biopsy can reveal xanthomas or xanthogranomatous or other di diagnoses that may even be treated by antibiotic, but it will be settled by biopsy. Because if we have large kidney, sufficient to biopsy, and no lymphoma, it is, no, it is not, it is, it is not lymphoma. To be honest, I mean, yes. sorry to interrupt, I mean, our no case problem. didn't find any lymph node other than the infiltration of the kidney. So it is a lymphoma confined only to the kidney. Yes. Which was, I mean, very interesting. Without the kidney biopsy, this lady was not to be diagnosed with lymphoma. Yes, yes, sure. And I think the couple of cases that we had in the past, they were localized to the kidney, just in nephromegaly. You know, you, you know, within the same week, we have a known patient to us with chronic lymphocytic leukemia who came in with the same picture and we biopsied him and again, leukemic infiltrate in the kidney. So I, I think it is a teaching case. Ultrasound is valuable and I consider ultrasound is not an investigation. It is the clinical examination Mandatory. of the kidney. It is the examination of the kidney because uh, usually we don't feel the kidneys except if they are large kidneys. So a clinical examination of the kidneys nowadays is ultrasound dependent. Dr. Unaymat, now you are unmuted. <تصفيق> أنا هلا معك والله بس كان الماوس معلق ما زبط معي بس كنت سامعك والله يا حسين لا 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 كان صح لا 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 لا
بس كان الماوس معلق ما قدرت تعمله ان ميوت فيري انترستنج كيس الحقيقه طبعا اي لايك اي ود لايك تو هير فروم دكتور فيصل شاهين بيكوز هي از ويز اس سينس ذا بيجنينج دكتور فيصل ما نقدرش ما نسمعش صوتك يعني ما ينفعش مساء الخير كيف يا فيصل كيف حالك؟ ما شاء الله دكتور رياض اي دونت نو فروم فروم وير يو جيت ذس كيس دكتور رياض يعني يو ار And يعني, amazing that you did everything for your patient and from different country as well. So uh, I, I'm very, uh, very interesting actually in, in, in those cases. And it is uh, really, it is learning. And uh, the discussion was amazing, uh, especially from Mohsen. Uh, and he's, uh, he's always... Professor. Always going to this, and everyone. Thank you very much indeed. Shukran, I have nothing to add, but I learned a lot today. لا أنا حابين نسمع صوتك فقط لا. أنا حابين نسمع صوتك ما ينفعش. تورا دولة. Thank you. We are pleased. مسيك بالخير يا فيصل. تورا دولة. بالخير أهلا محمد. We are pleased to hear you, Professor. Allah. تورا دولة. Thank you very much. Thank you. Shukran, Tor Faisal. شكرين يا باشا. Shukran, Shukran. دكتور دولة برضه الأم ميوت عندها في مشكلة. إحنا إحنا سعداء جدا يا دكتور رياض والله بال ناخد تعليق من الدكتور الغامدي عشان نقفل بقى الدسكشن لأن إحنا أكتر من ساعتين دلوقتي. دكتور الغامدي مسك الختام بقى. أنا ثانك يو فيري ماتش أنا أي ثينك ذيس فيري انترستنج كيس أنا أجري ويز بروك فري أوف سايد ونيفر يو سي لارج كيدني ذير إز أونلي ون دايجنوز إن انفترتيف بروسيس which most likely due to lymphoma, especially in this elderly patient uh, population. Uh, one uh, thing uh, regarding the, uh, uh, this, this case is really straightforward in my judgment, but I must so IgG4 is another oh. uh, diagnosis before with a biopsy, uh, IgG4. لكن اي جي 4 دي كان هاف اكشولي سلايتلي لارجر كيدني سلايت لارجر كيدني نوت نوت هيوج كيدني لايك نوت لا نوت 14 سنتيمتر نو نو But okay. they can give some like tumor-like if you do CT scan on them or MRI. Uh, okay. So this is actually the point which has I want to mention. And One the, last point about the briefest. And the IgG4 will be solved completely by the biopsy. No, no, no. This is actually this lymphoma. Okay. By okay. the way, the endo, the the adrenal thickness, which we said by Prof. Riyad Said, I think it's responsible for the bank that the patient has. And uh, might have a block mm -hmm. So this is really which could explain the whole uh, situation. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Lamdi. I think you now we are uh, two hours and uh, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. So, I mean, I don't know if I'm in Arabic, but I'm in Arabic. 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 I'm in الدكتور رياض سعيد استاذنا حالات جميله جدا وروح جميله وحضرتك زي ما الدكتور غنيمات قال حضرتك قاعد في الجنينه انا حتى كبرت الصوره في بعض الاحيان صوره جميله فعلا دكتور غنيمات ساعدنا بيك النهارده وان شاء الله تبقى معانا بعد كده تقدم حاجه برضه الدكتور القوسي ما فيش كلامي وفي حقه لانه خبره و... و... وانسان بنتعلم منه حاجات كثيره جدا مش النفرولوجي بس الشكر موصول لكل الساده الضيوف اللي معانا طبعا الدكتور الغامدي والدكتور فيصل شاهين من السعوديه وفي طبعا ناس كثيره جدا من السعوديه واشقاء من دول اخرى هنا من مصر طبعا كثير جدا دكتور سعيد خميس دكتور طارق طنطاوي دكتور محمد سعيد وكثيرين جدا واعتقد اللي هيشوفوا اليوتيوب بعد كده ان شاء الله اليوتيوب الفيديو ده هيبقى على اليوتيوب قبل الساعه 10 صباح الغد باذن الله أنا مش لاقي كلام أعبر به عن سعادتي وامتناني للدكتور رياض في هذا يعني ربنا لأن أنا بتوجه لربنا سبحانه وتعالى بخلص الدعاء يديك الصحة والعافية وإن شاء الله على موعد إن شاء الله مع ترانسبلانت نفرولوجي كيسز ميتنج هنخليه إن شاء الله أنا كلمت الدكتور أحمد حلاوة هو عنده هو في كيس استنى إيش هيقوم 13 8 سي إم في في ترانسبلانت كيس وهيدي محاضرة عن السي إم في الخميس 20 8 ما اعرفش يناسب حضرتك ولا لا دكتور رياض الخميس 20 8 20 اغسطس ده بعد عيد بكثير لو تبعد عن الخميس شويه يعني خلاص نعملها نشوف اسمها ليله خميس اسمها ليله خميس ما انا ما انا قلت له ابليس في العرب لكن هناك في انجلترا مش الخميس مش ويك اند 
ف ف هنخليها في وسط الاسبوع ان شاء الله وسط الاسبوع اللي هو اللي هو ممكن الاربع ثلاث حالات اربع حالات ترانسبلانت كيسز يبقى الاربع طم... يبقى الاربع 19 او الثلاث 18 اغسطس ان شاء الله حدد انت آه. واحنا جاهزين والدكتور حسان موجود واهل يعني لا رائع شغالين مع بعض لا انا كويس ان حضرتك فكرتني ان دكتور حسان انا كنت مخ... يعني عين له شكر خاص لانه انا يعني معجب جدا بطريقته الهاديه جدا وانا شفته بناقش حالات في عمان والنهارده ما شاء الله حالات كلها رائعه وبتنم بتنم عن خبره وادراك ومعمل قوي جدا بنحييه عليه انا هترك دكتور غنيمات يطلق بقى الايه نهايه الجلسه يعني كل الشكر جلسه جميله علميا وشفنا بعض وقبل العيد يعني الخميس القادم او الجمعه راح يكون العيد ان 10 دايز ب 30 الشهر كل عام وانتم بخير جميعا يا رب ربنا يعيدوا عليكم بالصحه والسلامه واحنا خلصانين من الكورونا ونرجع نشوف بعض فيس تو فيس ان شاء الله تعالى لانه اشتقنا لكم جميعا يعني نحضر ف... نحضر البحر الميت ولا <تصفيق> طبعا ان شاء الله احنا بشهر اثنين مؤتمرنا قائم كما هو فالكل مدعو ان شاء الله تعالى شكرا جزيلا لكم جميعا احنا متشكرين جدا طول رياض بي متشكر لحضرتك وحضرتك تختم يعني اخر كلام لحضرتك بقى اولا شكرا جزيلا للساده الزملاء اول شيء زميلنا الدكتور حسان طبعا الشكر الموصول للدكتور محسن غلبناه معانا يعني وي بوت هيم اون ذا سبوت سام تايمز وي ديفرد اوكيجنالي بات ريلي وي اجريد موست اوف ذا تايمز طبعا بالنسبه لك يا حسين انا اي تول يو دونت كومنت اباوت ذيس كيس بيكوز اي ثينك يو الحاله اللي اخذناها في عمان ما انا حضرتها في عمان فعشان هيك عشان كده عشان كده انا ما قلتش لمفوم انا قعدت عشان كده اه عشان كده بس بس حاله الكارو ميجالك الكارو ميجالك انا جبتها من الاول من غير ما <تصفيق> فقلنا يعني حاجتين فشكرا جزيلا للاستضافه وامل انه لا بالعكس حضرتك ده, ده بيتك واتمنى انه تكون يعني كنا على مستوى المسؤوليه مع الاخوه جميعا وكل عام وانتم بخير انا بشكرك شكرا جزيلا بشكر الدكتور حسان والدكتور غنيمات والدكتور القوسي وبشكر كل الناس اللي معانا واللي هيسمعوا الفيديو بعد كده انا عاوز اقول لحضرتك انه ده منتدى حقيقي للوطن العربي كله مش لمصر ولا الاردن ولا السعوديه احنا كلنا كيان واحد وعلى الاقل نتحد على الزوم ميتنج في النفرولوجي كوميونتي بشكركم بشكركم والى اللقاء بشكركم شكرا جزيلا مع السلامه